Knowledge about the local weather conditions at which Ridge works best, what type of conditions, mainly Frank, you know the area better, and some general getting away advice for Mike. That'll be a Mike notice. Only for Power Street Rock, no further away. Okay, so um, I think what I can say kind of usefully is something like this that we've, we've got our script and we've got the two nursery of the fifth week teetotal and Maggie. And Maggie ends in it, Errol's knob. So on a like typical day that we may well get in the next season, maybe typical weather that's coming El Nino. Um, where we've got southwest and we've got sun coming down. And so we, we, we've got like bush up here, but then below there's um, quite a bit of farmlandy grass and stuff. And so the sun heats up that ridge. You see, it's going to hit that ridge. It's going to hit this back side of this ridge. So um, th this ridge is not going to get the sun first thing in the morning. Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. So the winch is at the bottom. And, and the winch is here. Yeah. yeah. Keep asking me questions. You're talking about. And the yeah. lake's at the top, no doubt. The lake's right up yeah. here. Just yeah. getting out of bearings. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I think yeah. a lot of the getting people, yeah. what, what, what I'd advise them to do is to get on the wind. You know, you're going to release at the same place every time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maximise your height and get across on the high ground, either there or there. In this case, earlier in the day, the sun is more likely to be here. And don't like mess around too much. You know, get there, fly your best speed to get there. We need to talk a little bit about that because you don't want to be flying up wind to get there. But try and get there as high as you can because you want to be able to get on top of the ridge to orbit around on the ridge because you're not allowed to orbit below the ridge. You have to do S turns and up around. Yeah. You're not allowed to because you're not. You know, I'm talking to the just gone solo people. Mm -hmm. me. Um, also, orbiting around in front of the bridges is a whole risky business. So, and, and, and the other thing is, if you encounter a bit of lift on the way, you've got to make a decision whether to stop for it or not. And I would say people generally make the mistake of stopping for it. Yeah. I think, I think it, it tends to be better to use your height to get there and, and hope you're going to get something there. And it's called Errol's Knob for a good reason, because Errol Shurtleff was a very accomplished pilot in our club, and he like always went there. More or less, and um, like all my has got away. And so my default position is to go there. Sometimes I don't think a lot, you know. I'm just sort of getting the, the next thing I'm launched, and I just sort of turn that way, like it's still automatic way to turn to get there and get onto Errol's Knob. Now sometimes the lift will come before you get Errol's Knob in that gully. Other times there's a sort of a saddle there. And the best lift is in that saddle. And then, then there's another bit of a knob there. So as soon as you've got to go around in front of the arrow's knob and, and try and get the, you know, because nothing happens. Now, when, when you do run into some lift in this case, your job is to orbit nicely, to do nice circles in it, fly perfect circles. And um, worry more about flying perfect circles than centering. I think some beginning people spend too much time trying to centre. Now, when you're um, flying a glider along and you're going to turn, you're going to mess it up. You know, like, you're going to... Gliders fly best in a straight line. When you turn, they become inefficient. They create drag, you know. Of course, you have to turn. You know. But um, every time you sort of straighten up and try and centre the thermal, you're, you're flying badly, aerodynamically, even if you're flying perfectly as a pilot. Yep. Sorry, in regards to the thermal, are you talking fly perfect circle as in regards to the air mass or the ground track? Because the wind's going to change that. Do you want me to look out the window and fly perfect circle across the ground or just a perfectly coordinated 
a uh, constant uh, angle of act turn and sit in the thermal. Does yeah, the thermal yeah. move with the wind? Or? Good question, they move with the wind. <laughs> right, so I just buy a nice balance, as good as I can turn, yeah. Yeah, and, I should, and I should go with the mm. thermal. Mm. Okay. <coughs> so now, Sorry. now, of course, you know, we will be trying to send the thermal, but I'm just sort of cautioning against too much of that. I think it, the thing should be perfect circles. And and then just do just as me think, well, that's better this way, so I'll straighten up a bit there and take a bit more that way. Um, now, the other thing I'd say, that, that this is the safe bridge, you know, for people who are early solo, this is the more benign rip, so if, if there's any chance of this rig working it's in the early days, definitely go there. Because, you know, we're talking about southwest wind, you're going to be working this side, you're going to be very careful not to get this side in, in the rollover and get tumped. And, and when things go wrong, just go to this way. But if you're here, it can be a bit scary getting low, you're going to go all the way around. You know, we've already had one of our guys Get it wrong and end up trying to make the man a little bit tag. He, he got it wrong because he, we used to get southwest all the time. <laughs> and he got southwest all the time in the short fine red. But one day it was that way. Yeah, the story. <laughs> and he, he just sort of, without thinking too much, he's up here and he went over the other side of the ridge. Of course. It's not very happy if you go on land down here. Okay, I think that's about all I Klaus? Klaus? Klaus. Klaus, would you mind moving across a bit, please? No. Possible? No. <laughs> You're the tallest guy in the room. No. You're right. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Frank, one, one more annoying question to ask. No. In that turn, yeah. in that turn, what speed are you flying? Look at the drag, minimum sink? Yeah. 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 Okay, sorry ignore me there. Come on later. Well, we'll maybe you might talk about that. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it later as part of the thermal. But at the moment, one of the questions you asked, and he's an expert at it because he never takes more than one launch, was just how to get away off the launch. Yeah. Yeah. So can I look up to what you said? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I concur with 100% of what Frank has said there. Um, the key things that are, um, there are four places to get away. And uh, Catherine will be able to tell you all about it because we, we tried two of them on the weekend. There's yeah. a little bit of a bowl here where they've cut all the trees down. And there's another, it sticks out a little bit, you've got the white cliffs there, and then you've got another bowl here. And when you've got the wind running this way, um, that's the two places to go. So you've got one there, you've got one there, you've got one here, and you've got one there. So there's about four go-to places if you need to. You asked about the house thermal. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, you probably agree, those who mm -hmm. disagree, and yeah, if you have one, it gets away off every winch launch. So, if the wind's blowing, and the key probably to think about it is to think, start thinking about it like on Wednesday, okay? Before you even go up there, that's one of the key things that I wanted to look at. I'm already looking at the weekend's crap weather, okay? And I'm starting to look and see which way the wind is, and I'm already starting to think what it's gonna be. And then when, before you get in the glider, you need to, don't do what Frank's done, but he's good at it, and he's good at it. You need to know which way you're gonna turn before you take off, okay? Mm -hmm. Have a look at the birds, have a look at the previous person that's up there, um, everything like that, you know. Um, yes, that's a very good one, but you go around the corner there, and if you've got a low winch launch, then you're below the trees, and that's not a good idea for people in the just yeah. early summer. And as a club rule, that you're not supposed to go below the trees around there. And what happens is you get low, and I hate it around there, and then you'll end up coming back around here, You'll be here about 700 feet because the hill is coming over the hill and jumping, and you do not want to try and do a proper circuit. You just have to do a left-handed circuit, so you're going all the way down to Lee over the farmhouse and you're getting dumped. Okay, but that's what you've got to do. But that's what you don't do. Okay? <laughs> you might see me do it. Don't you don't do it, all right? You will end up turning in here. Okay. So really, there are one, two three, four different places which are the hot spot. As I say, the trick is to start looking at the weather forecast on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, start looking at the clouds, looking at the birds, looking at the previous person, use all of them. So when you're sat in the glide, you, you don't have to think about it, you know. Um, I mean, we don't think quite so much about it, but if you've got it planned in your mind, take off, 
and I'm going to go across here onto the ridge. I'm going to try that one, go over that little knoll there. Remember, there's a whole heap of sink usually there. And uh, if they talk to Catherine, we could go at those two on Sunday. We could see them through the snow. Um, you, don't, you don't go behind the ridge, and you don't go behind that bowl as well, because of course the wind is doing that. So it's going up here, and it's going down there. And the nice thing about doing it here, as Frank's rightly said, you could do that. If it gets it wrong, you could just do that. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Which um, is not ideal. It's not good airmanship, but it's the safe thing to do. You're, you can operate quite safely down to here to say about 700 feet, because by the time you're there, you're 500 feet. By the time you're there, you're 300 feet. You've done the circuit. Okay. But really speaking, at your stage, and we'll talk about it for type conversions a bit later on, you need to be here. Okay, so if it goes wrong, go there and then do a proper circuit so you stand all right. So, yeah, there's one other little quick thing I'll just say um, is that if, if you get northwest conditions, and they needn't be sort of strong northwest conditions. Now, this the, this is the high point here, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, the high point. It, it's in that, that sort of quarter there. If you've got enough height, come around that high point and try that looking for a thermal here. And it, it, you've got enough sort of low ground to sneak out again. But, uh, but uh, we, we, it's, it's a bit advanced that, but it's been a, a, a reliable way of getting away with northerly conditions. The thing to do is to know where you're going beforehand and have a really good think about it so you know where you're going. And then it gives you the best chance. And we'll talk about speeds to fly and we'll get some pieces in a minute because there's a lot of classic things that go wrong with people who try those. Which? Say again? Anyone else here? Yeah. What? Yeah. App or where do you look at your weather forecast on? Look at the wind. Um, I just look at map view for the wind. I do have SkySight. Uh, SkySight is very good. Um, you can predict um, the wind and the wave and all of those things. So SkySight is very good. Dr. Jacks is this man's expertise, he'll tell me about that. That's just as good and free, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Jack I'm very familiar with and um, doesn't go very far out, so I'm just a day ahead to with Dr. Jack. So I tend to look at windy. Yeah, we use windy. Because it's free, isn't it? I'm mislaid, I don't know. That's the same. He's can get a T5 gram on wind. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the links are on the kitchen. club website for RASP and for. Is, no, Windy's not on there, is it? No. Windy's an app. That's right, yeah. Windy, yeah. Windy, yeah. Um, basically, if you've got anything more than about 10 knots and it's slightly left of the centre of the runway, something's going to be working. The more westerly it is, the more you need to be just here and just here and not not there okay and the more you need to be here and not here or here and as Frank said the sun's on there in the morning so if there's anything slightly this way you go to that point you know if it's straight down the strip is here because once you go around the corner the wind just accelerates off down the hill and you're wrong for the ride and you've got to get back so yeah. that is quite an advanced route. once you go around the corner it's quite advanced you know and um, and it's quite terrifying how quickly you go down. So if it's anything like that, the safest option is off the winch, turn right, go here, and then try that, and then try that, and then go across and try that and scuttle back if it doesn't work. It's the payment trick. Okay. That's all I want to understand that one. Thermally. You start with thermally and you can carry on afterwards. Okay, okay thermally. Um, The key thing about gliding, as Frank said, is the best speed to fly and all the best things to do is to glide with flying in an absolute straight line at one or two speeds. So we'll cover it all down in a bit, bit more detail. If you're going to thermal, um, you need to be able to fly properly. That is the very first thing. Catherine started off somewhere between 50 and 70, and 50 and 60. 50 and 55, and then I started, and then 50 and 53, 
you know, she got better and better and better and better and better and better. And I was still growling in three knot difference, wasn't I? Anybody worried? Growling, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, I was just pointing her in the general direction of flying a little bit more accurately. And everything it was brilliant. And she nailed it. And what a difference it made, wasn't it? When we started, it was like that. It was just, just knocking the rust off. That was it. And once we were able to fly round circles in the air mass, okay, and at a constant angle of bank, constant speed you can predict where you are in the air mass okay if you fly fast and then slow and then fast and then slow you fly an egg shape so you can't unless you're able to see egg shapes in your head you can't picture where what you're doing and the trick to thermally is to just find where the best lift is and you use that by feel and by variometers feel is the primary that's instant variometers. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. They're three or four seconds behind the industry. Okay. And one thing that you do need to do with the thermal is um, we've got the hill like that. This is this is um, the nursery ridge. Okay, the wind is blowing up like that. And it comes up like that. And once you uh, down and usually heats up down around where the uh, the river is and stuff like that. The sun's cooking this. It's later in the afternoon and you get a thermal, so you get a hot bubble of air, so it comes off and it blows downwind with that. And obviously the trick to do is to be here and to let yourself go with the air mass. But remember, the thermal starts in the same place all the time, okay? So yes, it'll blow up, but it's always, it's still coming from there. So once you get blown back to here, you then push forward again, okay? So you don't let yourself go down here because this starts to happen. But it does at some point separate where the ridge is not affecting the thermal. Okay? So when you're low down, say you're below the top, okay? uh, you'll be doing S turns. We'll talk about that in the ridge turn in a minute. But, you stick, but when you do your thermal in, you'll go like that and then just push forward again. And then like that, maybe one or two turns and then push forward again because it's coming off the same place. So the thermal, although it drifts downwind, it's always starting from that same hot spot whether it be a brownfield, industrial estate, or very often the riverbeds wherever we are, they seem to kick things off. Okay? And this is the time um, when you need to notice where your drift is. So you're doing these nice round circles so that every, the information that you're being fed back is not distorted by if your inability to fly at constant speed. And you'll be drifting this way. So then when you, so you'll straighten up and you'll go that way back into the middle. You won't go that way or that way because remember it's blown directly downwind. Okay? So the trick is to do two or three turns or S turns or whatever it is. But if it starts easy, um, dying off, then just straighten up a little bit and go away, which is what we did on Sunday. We did a few, two or three turns and then go in. And you might only get one turn and then go forward. Maybe two turns and then go forward. Um, and the thermal in the way I was taught with John Williams, he called it a coolie's hat, which is um, you know, how what the uh, Vietnamese and the Chinese wear and things like that. So when you're flying into a thermal, so this is the ground here, um, and you're coming into a thermal, um, I should have made one earlier. Um, if you get around the outs, this is a, a circle a bit, if you're flying around the outside of the thermal here, You've only got about two knots there, okay? The closer you get to the center, it's three knots there, four knots there, and five knots there, okay? So when you fly into the thermal, um, so when you fly into the thermal, if you fly into the side of the thermal, at the, out here, it'll only be two knots because you're over here, okay? Yep. And if you fly in that side, you'll find your left wing will come up a little bit. Okay? If you fly into the center of the thermal, it'll get stronger and stronger and stronger because you know the, the, the closer you get to the center, that's four knots, that's three knots, five knots, etc. etc. So the trick when you come into a thermal is to and is to feel a friend used to close his eyes, but I wouldn't recommend that, is to feel which way it's going. Feel it. Feel the acceleration. Remember, the variometers are three seconds behind where you are. They're recording what happened ages ago. Okay. 
Okay? So try and picture the thermals of that shape. They're, they're not when they're here, but they are when they're here, or we're out on the flats. Okay? We, we could do with mounted thermals a bit later, they're much more like this. Um, but have a think, when you're flying into it, picture where you are on that hat. Oh, it's over that way. So where are you going to go? You're going to go over to the left, you know. Direct, straight. It gets stronger and 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 then weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So the, the trick is to anticipate to turn here before you go out the outside. Mm -hmm. They won't help you because you've gone. You're, they're, they're three or four seconds behind. So you're out here when the Vario suddenly starts to go down and then you start to turn. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. So use your backside. That is your. That is the number one thing that I use. You can feel it in your face. You can feel it in the air. You're suddenly having to put a bit of left air on. Try and picture where that thermal is. Okay. And then it's that shape, except for the mountains. So try and picture how you can, um, where you are in that rising air mass. Then fly perfect circles, because when you're flying, let's look at the plan view of that. So that's the top, and that's the circle. If you're flying perfect circles like that, you'll go up, 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 down, 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 up, 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 up. The way I sort of teach people is to say, well, we don't want to be here, do we? And, you know, I'll let people do two to learn, and then I might say, we're not doing that again. So you obviously, you can feel the acceleration, so you, you keep going until you feel the acceleration stopping, and that's, the, that's how you center something. But you're using all of the, you're coming into there, you're rising because you're going into this stronger, stronger, remember it's four, five, six, seven, eight knots, you know. It's rising, 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 falling, 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 sinking, 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 rising, 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 falling, 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 sinking. Picture that and then think it's over there. And most of you guys get it. I say, where is it? And they go, yeah, it's over there. Ooh, it's over there. But do round circles because if you're doing that, where the hell do you go? <laughs> And that's why you need to speak. I'm talking about that. Sorry, Frank. Yeah, I, I think it's just a couple of things. I, you know, we have a lot of problems with people going early sideways, launching and landing back, you know, just not staying up. And, and I think that one tip is to keep the ego on that altimeter. When you get into your first thermal, do, do the perfect circle. This is my advice. Mm -hmm. Do the perfect circle. Try, you know, so you, you, you're holding the stick gently. Trying to keep that string straight, so you may have been a top runner, might want to talk about that, but you know, you're trying to fly the glider up, uh, smoothly, and Jerry O'Neill says 45 degree of bank, 50 knots, that does a rule of thumb, but maybe you're not 50 knots. But my point is that if you're going up on the altimeter, just keep doing it, just keep doing it. I wouldn't worry too much about trying to centre at this very early stage. Mike's exactly right. Cross country mm -hmm. climber. You know, you just desperately got to get up. And if you're going up, to stay with it. And if you're not going up, stay. And you're not going down. So long as you're not going down, just stay with it. Just stay with it. It'll, it'll generally get better, and you will start going up. Okay. Once you come off the winch, you've got two minutes, three yeah. minutes, and, yeah. and that's why he's absolutely right. So many people go. Oh, I mean, Ollie, on his first flight with me, he just flew straight through two knots on Everest Knot. I said, what, 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 what's wrong with that? He said, what's wrong with what? He only <laughs> noticed it, you know. Um, so it, it's, you know, if you get something, stick with it. And generally, if it's up, that's great. Because once you're going round and you're generally going up, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, that might make you go up because if you spend less time in the sink and more time in the lift, you'll generally go up. Well, that'll do. As he says, that will absolutely do. Just stick with it, and then then you'll get fed up of going down on half a turn and up on the other one, and you'll suddenly realise I'll go over there, you know, and you'll do it, and it will either work or it won't work, and that's how you learn. You know, I've done it for like 47 years. You know, I've done so many things differently. Like I've read the book and thought, wow, well, that won't work, and I'll try something else, and it does work, and sometimes it doesn't work. You know, I, you know, I'll fly oblong circles, but I've already got it in my head where it is. I know where it's come from, I know where it's going to, I know where it should be, but that's, as Frank's dead right, if you're going up, stick with it. When I you know, was a young fellow, I was looking for a book called How to Find and Keep Girlfriend. When I was a young fellow, I was looking for a book called How to Find and Keep Girlfriend. 
because it, it's easy enough when you're learning to fly to fly out the thermal when you're trying to centre it better. Yeah. Right, and, if you're going up, keep going up. Like and so. I still do, to this day, go the wrong way. So. <laughs> and, and another thing is that um, some early stuff people do is, is, is they let, so you're flying along, and this is after you've got up a bit, you're going somewhere, you're flying along, and, and your left wing goes in the thermal and lifts it up and, and the glider changes its course and the pilot sets it changes its course and he wanders around it and another thermal you just throw them around you're just, you're just throwing three two thermals you know that's right. but the thing is you'll do this it's a fly straight line and if the wing lifts turn into that the wing. turn into the lift you know push the wing down i mean you got to make a decision whether it's worth turning in but, but can I ask you something? Just assume you are low, first thermal, and yeah. you want to catch it differently. Yeah. Back to that ridge. When you go, let's assume you hit it more or less straight, which is like yeah. anyway. When you turn in, you, you you feel it going up, is it one second, and just go, or do you try to wait until it goes down? Is that? It was 30 seconds in Australia. 30 seconds? In Australia. Mm -hmm. Here, it's pretty much instant. Also okay. Wiring. Because you're going over, this is the, the, the airstrips yeah. here, this is the nursery ridge. They're little tiny, I call them juveniles, you know, and, this, and, and then they die and then they'll get really young and exciting and that. And eventually you'll get one that will do this, you know. So you've just got to, they're, they're mind you, you've really got to be, and we'll talk about that in the ridge really, you've really got to be an expert at S turning. Again, we did that on Sunday too. Shame it didn't take a video and everything on the telling you here. And then eventually it'll come off the top, and when it stops being affected by that one, because it'll go and die. So just push forward and have another go. You know, stick with it. You know, S turn, two or three turns, and then eventually maybe one of them will, will go okay. But as Frank said, you've got to stick with it. So I've, I've so many people go, nah, and then never find another one. Or you're down here, and of course they're going this way down there. You know, there's more horizontal component. You know, the wind changes direction. We're all sitting on the airfield, you know, and then suddenly the wind's behind you. Mm -hmm. What's that? If you look up there, it's a great big cloud because it's getting sucked. So they're going that way when they're low down. So the higher you are, the better. And and you'll find that the thermals are rubbish here until they hit this, and then they've got the influence of the ridge and the thermal, which is why we get away off the ridge really well, because we've got the two added together. The ridge on its own might be rubbish. Thermal on its own might be rubbish, but when you add two lots of what rubbish, two knots, you've got two knots instead of one knot, one knot. Lo and behold, it's better than you made in the seat. Tell you later. Mm -hmm. You go up, but you have to fly. The one note of the work, my closing note was that you fly, and people you hear me use you. Sometimes you fly like a ballet dancer, you know, and that's when you are just, and it's just, you just feel this. And I, I fly with my two fingers, three fingers on the bottom of the stick, you know, and I'll just. Ooh, that's enough, no more than that. Because if you do that, great big ailerons drag and you get horrible. If you get a one that pushes your house down like that, boof! And so you go from being a ballet dancer to a boxer, you know? And you've got to know when you run into it if it's one or the other. Mm. And thermals grow. Thermals, when they're starting out, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, stronger. And when they're dying, they get weaker and weaker. So you've got to lure by missing them which is a good one and which is a rubbish one. If you, you can feel them getting better, and they get better very quickly here. But if you get one they're halfway between the ridge and there, and you just stick with it, stick with it, do what Frank says, stick with it, it'll hit there, it'll get another two knots, and by the time it's there, it's all accelerated up, poof, off you go, that's it. Straight away, it's good. It's sort of an unfair business for the rich to get richer, you know, in a capitalist society, and the people that get higher get higher. Right. The um, thermal tend to start narrow. You know, generally speaking, they'll be you know, thermal. As it goes up, the air pressure relaxes. You know, it gets less air pressure and expands. And they're also in trains here, so the higher you go, it tends to be a bit So they sort of end up, up in a funnel shape, do they? Sort of yeah. expanding out. They expand, as Frank said, because yeah. the air pressure's decreasing so they're getting better but also the air the volume of air i mean there's millions of tons isn't it oh eighty thousand. the number is just mind-blowing just think 
why didn't it hit me on the head or anything? The <laughs> amount of air going up is tons. So, you know, you, you get in the right place and you're going up if you fly I think between 50 and 55. I think the best way to think of thermals is, is that they are an event. It's sort of like if you've got a big sheet here, you know, a bed sheet, and, and, and you pick it up, you know, it's like that, and it goes up in that sort of candle shape, and it goes all the way up, and, and then there's another bed sheet here, waiting another five, ten minutes later, it'll go up. So, so it, 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 there are bubbles going up, but they're bubbling at all, so they're not going to constantly. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So if you lose so, it a little bit, what is it? You just sit it out some parts, and yeah. it might come back again. Yes. That's um, the point. So you don't, don't rush to the next that's one. That's the internet. Yeah, if they're teenagers, if it's still working, <laughs> oh, yeah. and it's gone. You might do one, two, two turns. Yeah. But if you were at three thousand feet, you've got two thousand seven hundred feet. You're a thousand feet above the airfield. You're one turn away from having to start the circuit at your stage. You know? So you know, use every clue you can. Other gliders, you know, birds, wind, clouds, where the last one came from, because it came from there, and sure as hell will come there, I mean, it's just got to warm up. You know, it's got hotter than the surrounding air, which is why. Yeah, I, I don't know how you got time to wait for the next one, usually. Not really. Sometimes there'll be a column, they'll be going with just a constant, you know, up, updraft. They're marvelous ones out of miles worth or something. But, you know, around here, the more than the time. They've left, they've left the ground. I've, in many contests I've been on, three or four guys was doing it, they go underneath two knots down all the way, and they're happily going up to six knots. They've pulled the ladder up. They've pulled the ladder up, you hear us say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ridges. Do you want to do ridges or? Start um, follow or? Well, I, I, I think, I think that, the, I mean, one of the happiest flights I ever had was with Rob Crowley in the back seat with Lisa's patients and me on this teetotal bridge in an old vintage glider called Brother Whiskey. And the, the ridge was working, you know, the wind was blowing, and, and I could just fly back and forth on this ridge, above the ridge, back and forth. And you know, I'd only just hang on solo. I was sort of smart. Don't <laughs> <laughs> need a motor. So, so I think that you know ridge days are going to be easy days for you guys to get time in the air, and I think last Sunday was one of those days. It was. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things about ridges. You know the dangers of ridges. Mike would probably be good at it. For your stage of ridge flying at the moment, the key thing to do is to turn in the lift. This ridge will work, and then there'll be bits that don't work, and then there'll be bits that do work. Firstly, stay in the bits that work, okay? So, as again, we've got our favorite two little bowls, we've got the bits sticking out there in our two little bowls, and nowadays, where they've cut all the trees further down, down where the power lines are, it's actually quite good down there as well now. It used to be, but it seems to be at the moment. So, when you're flying, you come off the, there's the airfield, there's the winch, you come off the winch, you go across there, <laughs> You get a good bit of lift here because it's working on there, and it's bad there, and it's good here. And if you're able to just stay there, or this one you tend to do across like that, do so. If you're able to increase your height, so many people go across and think, I'm going to go ridge soaring. You're going through the down, and then the up, the down, and you're, the net effect is nothing, you know? So. If you can get over there and S turn and get a bit of height, it gives you a bit more room to go a bit further that way, or over to Errol's Knob, or if you get to sort of 5,000 feet of sharing, you can go that way, you know. So the key thing is to turn in lift. This was the French taught me this, you know. So if you're going up, 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 anticipate when it's going to stop, and then make sure you turn. And of course, if you're going to go through an enormous amount of sink there and it's not very good here, well, stay there. And that's where you do your figure of eight. You do figure of eight because there's no other option. Because you're below the ridge, so you can't do that because you'll hit the ridge. And, the, and it's no good being out here because the ridge is this shape, okay? So the wind comes along, and it's only a very narrow area here that the ridge, that the ridge really works. If you're over, over the river here, you know, the wind's going that way, isn't it? So 
it's quite a narrow area, so you've got to stick in this bit. So you're flying along like this, and you turn out, or you go out of the hill, the ridge, and then what you've got to do is let yourself go back in. And again, remember the valley and the box or whatever you want to I, 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 I fly with a lot of people and they turn into the ridge, and then they turn out of the ridge, you know, and then they'll turn into the ridge again. Go and have a look at the size of the ailerons that are on the floor of the workshop, they're massive. So what, where, um, where I'm just doing my S-turn, I'll start, I'm, I'll turn, as, turn reasonably tight to stay in the lift, but then I'll ease the back, I'll let, uh, from here, I'll let the inertia do everything. I'll just let it, let it go around, I'll let it, just let it slide back into the hill. Don't drive it into the hill, because you're going to drive it out of the hill. And every time you do that, it's no good. So I, I tend to keep it tight, tighten it up, and then unwind it, and basically, let it so that it's by the time I'm pointing into the hill, it's one gentle ballet dance. So it's coming around and, and it's turned like that, it's coming, 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 and then coming out again. And I don't move the stick. From about there, it's one constant unwinding in the back, and then it's just automatically going back around the other way. Try and move it as little as possible. Okay? And then again, it goes out, so you want to tighten up a little bit there, and then about here. I've got it so this thing is just a gentle unwinding all the time. Unless you get massive surge, boom, you throw it in. So it's a matter of knowing when you're going to be tiptoes or when you're going to throw it in there. And again, remember, the thermals start here, and these are two beautiful gullies here. And that's what I mean. The wind is blowing that way, it tends to do that, which is why these are the two hot spots. But yeah, just um, turn and lift. Just you can, which again, you know, so. Our site doesn't have a long, easy bridge that you people can get onto. You know, like the matter matter, they got this high my ranges that go forever. Mm -hmm. um, over in Omarka, they've got quite a good ridge behind you know, the Orchard Spur and so on. But, um, but we, we should talk about the, the dangers of, of side spurs on ridges, Mike. Yep. I suppose kind of know all that, but yeah, just a just a question just about positioning yourself on a ridge. So <clears throat> pretend there's no gullies, it's just a it's just a perfect shape yeah. ridge in a straight line. With that wind blowing off it, am I looking to set myself up sitting right over the apex of the ridge or am I offset into the wind slightly? So where the wind, like, what's what's the theory? Do I want to sit right over the peak, or do I want to sit just off the apex into like in the yeah. windward side? There. Yeah. So so not right over the peak, a slightly on the windward side is where I want to if, sit. If you're racing, you've got one wing on the top. I'm not racing. Like one wing, like yeah. ten feet over the top. But what you're working for there is anything that's coming up this side as well. Yeah. You're not at that stage. So it's this area here. Yeah, so the general theory is just be close to it but slightly offset into wind and you should get the push up. Huh? Have a look at what works best. Yeah, well, you can use your variables then. You know, like if there's two knots and there is four knots, because remember here the wind is slowed down by the friction on the hill. So if you stand on the hill, yeah. um, there's not a lot of wind. But if you went 100 feet out from the hill, wind gradient, you know, like. I'm sure thinking as far as just a starting point, I need to know where to start from, so I start slightly up, but then you start yeah. looking at the altimeter and using yeah. the bum and feeling in it. Well, you don't need altimeter on the bridge, you've got trees. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Yeah, yeah. I, I need to know the start point. Do I start over? Go behind, or? ever. It's it, it, yeah. it not. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, that's, but that's where you, know, you sort of start there and then you're feeling it. So you'll be learning to fly here, okay? Then the better you get, You'll be doing this, the and then eventually your S turns. Remember, this is a horrible um, cross section that way. You'll be flying along the ridge here, and you'll turn out, and you'll tell when you turn out. You'll beep, 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 and you really want to be every form of lift that you do. You want to find the maximum rate of climb, even if you're not racing. This just helps you. You run out of day doing a cross country 50k cross country flight or you simply won't get to the next thermal mm -hmm. at your stage so it, anything goes is num rule number one rule number two is try and find something better really isn't it you know just try it and something and you'll soon figure it out you know um, 
once you can fly without thinking, you will be thinking, this is no good, there's only two, there's four over there. That's how my brain works. You know, you know, how can I how can I climb gin? Was the comment I made on Sunday. You're not really over that. So we did. Spurs. Um, this is a plan view. Do most people know where parachute rock is? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can't remember. So this is a top view. So the lake is here. Okay. So and so you've eventually done all the things that Frank said and I've said, and you've worked your way along, oh bloody hell, you're on the Samarna. So the wind's blowing this way and it's sticking up here. And the wind tech normally blows a bit of southwest, doesn't it? Okay. And you've got parachute rocks here, plus you've got all the other ones. Okay. A lot of people get hurt doing this. You, if you come, if you're flying down the ridge like this, so you come off of Mount Robert, which is the favourite trick. You know, you'll fly straight over there, and you'll come along there, and you'll stop. And the ridge, and this ridge is working beautifully. You get onto the spurs, the, all the little spurs that stick out, mm -hmm. and if you go even better, you think, "What? This is good." Okay, and and then you'll, and then if you're high enough, you'll go across. And what do you think will happen there? So, yeah, so but what it will do is it'll happen about there. And if you're only about 10 or 15 feet above the ground, that has killed a lot of people in this country. And in France, my friend carved himself on the French Alps because of that. Spent the night up there. So what you've got to do is you shouldn't ever cross ridges at 90 degrees. What's the recommendation for crossing ridges? 45 degrees? You should be crossing them, if you come up to that one, you should be crossing them at about 45 degrees. The logic being is if it suddenly goes wrong, and boy, it goes wrong fast, you can get out. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. The other thing to do is, it depends how low, because remember this is coming up like this. I tend to sort of give this area a wide berth. So I tend to come over there and then sort of go like that. Okay? And, and going the other way, is where people really, this the guy that managed to kill himself in the STEMI down south, he did exactly this. He was coming up, he was going like the bat out of hell in the lee of the hill. It was blowing like it does there. And all the lift was coming down and he was doing 100 knots. He thought, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll be able to like that. You know, it was going down so much that by the time, and he, and he didn't do this, he tried to go straight over. He hit the ground there and killed him and his son. Okay. And he just flown from England in that glider too. Because the sink is astronomical. And I, honestly, I've done it. I pulled up and just felt so good out. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to get out of there. Now we've got, we're lucky in the two seaters that we were about 580 kilos by some sort of flight. So we've got half a ton of energy. So that is useful. But when you graduate onto the single seaters, they're only 250 kilos plus me, 350. So you've got a lot less inertia, so you've got a lot less pull on and they're a bit draggy and things like that. But you shouldn't put yourself in a situation where you're required to pull up to go over there. Mm. Another friend of mine did it, it's called Lindsay's saddle now with a marimar. He tried to get over the saddle and his tailplane caught the fence and he got stuck on there. Isn't that tail wheel. Tail wheel, sorry, that's yeah. it, tail wheel. And he just stopped and he blamed the hill. But it's called Lindsay's saddle now because a marimar was here. All he had to do was that. Okay, it would have meant about a three-minute detour because it's quite a bit ridge and it's the nursery ridge that he was racing. He thought he was onto it, but the energy is sapped out of you by the sink. It's much so if you go in that way, cross it carefully and don't hug around there. If the wind is like that, yes, definitely. If the wind is like that. Yes, climb, 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 rich or rich or rich or rich or rich or dive for the next bit. Forget this. Okay. And that's the same on our little ridges as well, really, where those little high points, you know, my two favourite bulbs between the two. If you go at the back of that, you'll go down like that. Ridge. So when you want to go over it, just go out towards the clay cliffs a little bit sometimes and just go around. And then tuck right into the window facing the east. You know where the wind is. Mike, does that apply at the top of Speargrass as well? Top of Speargrass? Uh, on Errol's Knob side? No, right up on the Robert Bridge. Where it's coming over from right across. That does that blind corner. Yes, quite big spurs. Yes, you, you can't, oh, if you've got a southwesterly, it's coming yeah. in off Rotorah. Right. 
Yes. Then it's coming up over oh. that saddle, and you've got that big basin at the top of the grass, which yep. drops over into yeah. Angelus. Does it drop like that coming through? Yeah, I, I, I'll be so, going on the ridge, going on the ridge, and I know the wind's blowing that way. I'm coming up, and then you know, I'll be a bit of a bird. You know, you shouldn't find out. You know, um, depends if I'm racing. If I know, if I'm racing and I'm full of water, and I know it's working on the other side, well, I might not do what I just told you to do, but you will. Okay, because if you're not racing, you're doing 60, 65 knots, you're in a much lighter airplane, you're not 100% certain it's going to work around the other side, you know. So just, just to, and then the more experience you get, the closer you'll get, the more you'll try it, and then you'll get bitten by it, you know, and then you won't do it again, you know, that's how you learn. But you've got to do it safely, mm -hmm. you know, all of this stuff, do it, and then find out. And then you'll remember, oh, you told me about that, better not do that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the world said, listen, the inner voice, that little push, you know, so that was a bit close. Yeah. I've, um, I was leading the competition down south and I got turned over and nearly hit the hill and I pulled the brakes out and I landed because the front was dead so much. Mm. 2004. And I was doing nothing wrong. But the thermal hit me so strongly under the outside of the wind, it tipped me right over towards the hill and it was negative flat everything and you get out of it. <laughs> what that? That's right. Wave, wave, wave. How many of you have not flown away? Not for a long time. You use it all the time, you Christchurch and your Q300, don't you? Mm. Better do. Smash the road. You! No, not smashed, you're in the wrong place. In the, in, in the movie, it was a statement saying that you, you're required to wear parachutes when you're flying away. Mm. But we can't find any reference for that. It's not. That's actually wrong. You only need parachutes for aerobatics and flying in cloud, or if stated in the types of certificate. Okay. type certificate state pushing for parachutes. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea with parachutes. And, you know, tomorrow I'm going to go to speak on wave runs and some good traffic. But our wave locally is a lot different. Yeah. Little bits of waves don't really go anywhere. Yeah. And it's good fun to play. Yep, well we had that as well on Sunday. So, wave, for most of you know what it is, it's really the wind comes over some form of object. It doesn't need to go over an object, it can actually fall off the edge of a hill, um, which is a couple of them in America do that. But basically it just lets the hill, comes over, so this is McConaughey's farm here, this is the strip here, and this is the um, Das Errol's knob, and this is the nursery bridge. Exactly what happened on Sunday. As it comes over Errol's Knob, hits the ridge there, which is why you don't want to do a left-handed circuit because you're going to downwind in this to land on the strip. Okay? Somewhere over the airfield or over the river, it doesn't hit the ground, but you must imagine it like this. It hits the ground and then bounces back up again. Okay? Because many, many times the winch is there. I've been someone's been We've winched up to here, and then we're heading off over there, and I'm just sitting there looking at those, those are the real barriers out of AJ, and this, we're going up, and we just keep going. Okay, so that's where you find the wave, most of the time, at Lake Station, is here. Okay, so as soon as you, any form of southwesterly, any form of it's blowing down the hill, you're likely to find some wave. So once you come off the wire and you're heading across to my two little favourite little bowls, okay, um, just watch the barrier. If it, they, they stick up there for a bit because it takes a bit of time for them to level out. Okay, we'll explain a little later. But if, you're, if the altimeter is gently rising and it's still going up, well, start, start flying here. Start doing, they call it the wave, wave, wave. Um, you basically just gently circle and you'll get blown back, beep, 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 and it'll start going down and then you go forward again. Okay. So the wave's there. But what it can do, and what it often does, is it can also do this. Okay. Again, this is the nursery ridge. The wind's blowing like that. The ridge is going to work, is it? No. This is out of phase with it. So then you want to be here. Or usually this is the better way. Sometimes our nursery ridge is destroyed 
by the wave because the down of the wave is stronger than the upper up of the ridge. Okay. And and sometimes it only works out here because if the if the ridge is sort of here, you know, this bit will work, but this bit won't. Again, it's it's all about drawing a three-dimensional picture in your head of the coolest after the thermal, the ridge, picture where the ridge is blowing, where the wind's blowing from, and wave, it's the same thing. And um, if you stand on the ground, you can usually see lines of something. I'm quite good at drawing straight lines in the sky even if they're not wave there, but if you look at it and the clouds don't move, that's usually a wave gap, and it's usually over the ridge, or, and then over the ridge. So um, keep your eyes out for wave. But our local wave, which we, and it goes from here and it goes all the way to Mount Robert, is the favourite one. You can go nine and a half thousand feet quite up over here, climb right up to the bottom where Tom flies his toys, and you know, and we can go backwards and forwards very easily. And it also, you also get a lot of wave off of Mount Murchison, and then you go further into the mountains. There's a lot of other hot spots. But this is the favourite one. So you either pop around on and try and ridge soar Errol's knob, or you find a bit of wave here. And the trick of wave is to do exactly as Frank said, stick with it. If it goes up, just go around. And I tend to do a gentle turn like that, a little bit tightening up when I'm going downwind, otherwise you just run away downwind, and then open it up when I go back into wind. So I do fly oblong, um, oblong circles here. So there's our strip, there's the ridge. Let's imagine that the wave, well there you go, the wave's here, okay? So I come off the wire and I go across and then I'll let myself do these, because the wind's blowing this way, so you'll get blown that way. And then it'll be beep, 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 it's coming down, so it's time to go back. Now, wave is over the ground. Unlike the air, this wave is pretty much stationary. It doesn't move, but for the purposes of the day. So have a look down, and there's some beehives in the marina, always a good spot. And there's a field with this sheep in there. But there's, look at the fences, look at something, and go back there because that's where it will be. It does tend to drift back a little bit and then dissipate and then go back. Uh, but really, if you come off and you find some, so you'll just do the wave walk, that's what they call it. You do one or two for, you know, and then you go push back in again. And this is when a compass is really handy. We don't use compasses for navigating. But if you notice, if you notice what the wind is, I tend to notice what, when I'm pointing, into, I, I look at where my drift is, and then when I push back directly into wind, I'll look at what the compass is, and I'll look at what the, where I am on the ground, so I'll use those two. So I'll let myself go back. I tend to do, open it out, going into wind, tighten it up, going downwind. Open it out, going into wind, and that'll hold you in the same place as well. And then once you're in it, then you, the classic, because this obviously runs all the way along there, then maybe try a bit, but remember where that was. You know, try it. Try and find where the front of it is. Try and find where the back of it is. Keep going forward, do beep, 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 and then you go down like a backwards there, aren't you? You're going up there. And you need to be there. Like the cool is happening thermal, you want to be, it's no good there, and it's no good there. In fact, it's rough as guts there, the rough as guts there, because this is the rotor. You need to be in the very smooth bit in between where it's starting to go down and it's starting to get rough. And it's rough here as well, because this is the turbulence as well. But you just need to find that spot. One of the best ways to mark the cross spot over the ground is look out at a couple of points lined up, you know, and a couple of points that one. So I like push them do, finding spots, you can know, see marks on there. Normally you're like looking straight down. At Lake Station, what's the sort of um, minimum wind speed that wave sets up at? Are you looking for four forecasts at five knots, ten knots for it to work? Is there a zero sort of it's a, it's Below a it's zero, so <laughs> does it not go at does it not go at two <laughs> knots or if it's got ten knots in the forecast are you likely to see a wave or? No, it's a lot more complex than that. And to do a lot with the um, temperature profile of the EMS we're dealing with. You know. um, so you ideally want a unstable a stable EMS with the wave. Um, yeah, you do have it. But I don't know, more than saying that, I I'd, I'd probably give this out but I think, you know, another place to find a way for our local locally is over the Maggie. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that nursery ribs there. Yeah, you can push it out in front of it and pick up waves. I've got the 30,000 feet one Sunday. Where's the wave? 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 Where's
Steve, well, where's the wave coming off there? Because if you've got it coming off over the... the there's, there's actually bubbly, broken country through to Rotoroa from there with nothing yeah, particularly well, he, he, he speculates that Paparoa has set it up, that it's an oscillation all the way down one Yeah, it could be. I think it's uh, come off Mount Murchison too odd. No, but it's set up as a wave further towards the coast. Well, I mean, it's it's the first bump, and yeah. then it sets the oscillator, primary, secondary, tertiary yeah. waves. Yeah. Which, which, which means it should vary a huge amount where yeah. it turns again and comes over the Muller. Yeah. 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 Also, you have this yeah. a lake, which is a it's pond just of coal. So I don't know if it goes into there or bounces. Just go, just go up to 30. But that means you're always getting a bounce over that. I don't know how that, because it's all controlled by that mass of air in that, in that uh, lake basin. So wave really okay. is look it's up wind. Mm -hmm. Look up wind. Look up wind. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. kind of a mysterious thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. easier in places like Springfield and Marrow because it's a lot more textbook. Um, our site is a brilliant thermal site and not a good wave site, mm -hmm. but there's always a wave wave. You know, and if it just suddenly goes smooth mm. on Sunday, yeah. and, I said, and we were hard, too high to be on the ridge, and it was cold, so it was unlikely to be turtles, um, and it was wave. Mm. We got to four two, just gently, just by s, those by doing the wave walk, mm. one, two, back into wind, and then I said straight back, you know, right in the winch, straight back in the winch, because that directly to wind. Mm. We just kept doing it, and in the end we tried moving, and moving around didn't work. Staying oh. in one place did. Oh. You know, it was just very local. But once you get in it, suddenly everything goes. Doo -doo 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 -doo. You get across this magic layer. It's usually about four and a half thousand feet on the forestry on the behind the club rooms. You get you hit it, and then everything starts really going there because then you're into the wave. There's lots and lots of books on how it's formed, and you can drive yourself nuts in theory if you want. But it's all about wind increasing in height and stable air. I think I think you're more likely to get wave in the cold parts of the year than in the heat of the summer. But um, you know, we often think that thermals upset the wave, and wave upsets the thermal. But that thing of wave dumping on the teetotal ridge is is a common problem that we have. And the teetotal ridge like doesn't sort of it's a windy day, but it's really not working. And you get across on the main bridge and suddenly it's working. You know, the bridge works well out of phase with the wave or in phase with the wave. You know, it's just phasing the way. But um, it, sometimes you, 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 you sort of got thermals all day and, you know, in a colder part of the year or, or, or a longer part of the day, you know, the, the heat of the day is dying and then suddenly people are in the wave. Then you know, the wave sort of turned up. The day's time. Because the, yeah, the thermals, the wave is very linear, very smooth, and if you trip it up, it just destroys it. So you're right at the end of the day, usually the beginning of the day is wave, then the thermals come along and destroy everything, but it's still there because you get these really amazing thermals that are smashed up and they're incredible, and you don't know why, and then you'll get another one that just doesn't work. Well, one's in the up and one's in the down. You, you get up, yeah, it's not too balanced. If, you, if you're in it, stick with it. Okay, question six was, any other questions on bridge wave or thermal? What's the furthest distance I can go with the glider to get back to lake station within the glide ratio of the glider? What's the law to start with? You need to be able to land. What sort of L-A-R-E or L-A-W? The law is 10 nautical miles, yeah. unless you've got a, what's it called now? XCP. XCP, it was a QGP. And, the, and outside of that, you need a PLB and other bits and pieces. But really, it's 10 nautical miles. Now, it's not very clear, but I have drawn a circle of 10 nautical miles on here. And I'll pass it around afterwards. But basically, you can go to the Sonoran Range, and you can go um, over the back of the uh, nursery ridges and you can go down towards Kawatera Junction and you can go over towards Lake Rotorama. Okay, 10 nautical miles. I think the, the new training metric says 10 kilometers, yeah. which is 5.6 nautical miles. Yeah, which doesn't even get you onto Robert. 
just. It just. John five. Yeah. We did a simple challenge. Pass that around, and there's a five and a ten kilometer circle on there, and that's the answer to your question. So it is ten so, nautical miles. So we're working on nautical miles or kilometers. We're working. It's really yeah. odd. It was the guy who uses it. If yeah. you talk to ATC, you've got to talk in knots and nautical miles and degrees magnetic and feet. Okay. If you go to yeah. France, they talk in kilometers and meters high. Yeah. Okay. But in this country, you need to be using nautical miles, magnetic yeah. directions, feet, <laughs> knots. Because that's what everybody else is using. And if you talk to your mate and say it's 15k away, that's fine. Okay, and I'm sure there's an ATC will understand in K. So have you ever tried using kilometers? Yeah, I mean aviation's hilarious. They use every single unit and measure to prime pretend we're smart. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But, the but as, as far as interpreting that rule, are we reading it as 10Ks or 10 miles nautical miles? What what are you interpreting? So the law is 10 nautical miles. So we're going to stick with that and ignore what we're doing. Okay, we're going to ignore the wall. Yeah, perfect. Because that also means that you guys can have a better flock. <coughs> However, there's a caveat with that. You must be within a very safe gliding distance of the airfield. Yeah. I don't want to see people at 4,000 feet parachute rock. Okay? Mm -hmm. We'll get back from that, like, just. <laughs> but, you know, it's got to be some common sense. So, what tends to happen is for people. You in this room here, pre QGP or whatever it's now. The instructor will say, Yesterday you can go parachute rock, okay? Or yes, you can go mount rock, you know? But until you get the soaring pilot signed off, which Frank kind of printed out earlier this evening, you're not allowed to venture outside of that in 10 nautical miles, and you're not allowed to do so, and you're not, and you're still on checks. That's what they said. I, I, that, I read that on your thing today, it's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, yeah that, that was just, um, it's called soaring pilot, isn't it? The next yes. one is um, cross country pilot. Yeah. Anyway. So, do we have certain height? Right. Yeah. The glide angles of our gliders are about 30 to 1, okay? It's all very well it's until you hit, it's all very well until you hit the sink. Okay, mm -hmm. we have lots of that. The French in the Alps, whether you're flying a Nimbus 4 or a K6E like I do, they insist on 20 to 1. Okay, so I use this to the day to this day in my glider in the Alps. I stay within 20 to 1 of somewhere to land, you will stay within 20 to 1 of the airfield. Okay, basically, make sure you can see. So if you are 1,000 feet high, you can go 20,000 feet, can't you, yeah? Is that right? Yeah. Nobody said no. So 20,000 feet, a nautical mile is 6,000 feet, a statute mile is 5,281 feet. Mm -hmm. That's all that picks up. <laughs> so you divide that to there, so 6, 12, 18, so it's over. So basically that's three miles, okay? Six kilometers or one mile high. We're talking about the arrival height. No, I'm talking about the thousand feet now. That's yet to come. Yeah. You will stay with that's the numbers that you need to do. So for every thousand feet, you can go three miles with a bit of safety. Because remember, your glider actually does 28 to 1. It depends on the wind and the bank. Okay? But of course, if you are at 1,000 feet above the airfield, three miles away, you'll crash on the airfield. <laughs> so you must build in a circuit height, okay? And what's the minimum height you should arrive at the airfield at? 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet. 1,000 feet. Okay. 2,000 feet. So you need to, if you are three, four, if you are six miles away, and the airfield is, What's your alpha meter say here? 3,700. 
Okay? And my little circle of things. I'm on that. So you need to be two thousand you need to be two thousand, three thousand, you need to be four thousand seven hundred feet if you are on Mount Robert. I've I've got a couple of maps so that I can send people if they want with the uh, rings on for mm. distance for height versus distance based on that twenty to one and arrival height. So if anyone wants to oh, I'll email yeah. Is it possible huh? to have something like that on the wall at the Club We did have. I yeah. did it, but the maps updated themselves. Yeah. And then, you know, I had one in every. Uh, they were laminated and in the glider. Oh, okay. Can you get big hands? Where, where do you get that map? Yeah. We only need one photocopier. Yeah. But I'll, I'll send you the one I've got because it's got yeah. uh, it's got the topography. I'm used to having a map, yeah. a topo map. Yeah. With rings. Yeah. That's correct. Set yeah, that's up. what I'm talking about. I'll send you. So that's it's as simple as that, and that is part of your QGP XEB training is distance per thousand feet. So on a map, the world champion showed me that that's five nautical miles on a four mil map and it's ten nautical miles on a half a mil map. So you don't need circles. You won the world championships in Sweden like that. You go five, ten, fifteen, so fifteen nautical miles, three miles per thousand feet, bam. You need to be able to do that. Nobody's using PDAs, you're not there yet. Okay? Because if you use PDA, you won't remember that one. And I still use that one on final guys now. With two computers telling me I'm going to make it, and I still go, will I make it? Remember, if you've got a screaming gale this way, you might be lucky to make 20 away. That's right. You've got yeah. a screaming gale that way, you'll make 40 away. Okay? Yeah. So a bit of common sense, but the weather that you'll be flying in will make it back from the Sonarnas. So the Sonarnas are 10 nautical miles away? Just under yeah. that, aren't they? I think they're 10 yeah. kilometers. Just under 10. They're probably there are 8. Yeah. So you need 8, 6, 2400 feet plus 1000 plus 700, 2400, 3400. 5 1. There you go. That's all you've got on that. So basically 5000 feet. If you're at 5,000 feet on the sun, this is time to go back. I think that's important. Not to yeah. to come back. Remember, the Mark Robert, it was the net number on the bit, don't, don't fuck around and wait for another thermal. Mm -hmm. yeah, it right. tell, yeah. tells you in the thing that Frank printed out tonight, when you go through the pass criteria, you've got to know your local yeah. landmarks. Yeah. And so whatever local landmarks you want to know, he knows yeah. them all, you know, and you know a few of them. Just remember where they are in distances and and I would recommend even though we're all kilometers I know I recommend you use nautical miles because next in the next in the lecture in two or three times we'll be talking about ATC and he'll be about it you know because he talks to ATC all the time and you can't talk to them if you're not talking to them in feet miles for magnetic headings yeah okay right so that's three miles up there is three nautical miles well, it's 6,000 feet. If you divide by 5,281 and 6,000, it's nautical miles is the, is, the, is the unit of measure that is on that map. Well, that's what you, you should be using it. It should be always talking nautical miles for yeah, yeah. navigational distance. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 Anything else just confuses it. It's like if we're converting stuff all the time, it's, yeah. just stick to the one. Yeah. Yeah. It'll match up to what's on your map. It'll be easy. There's um, the yeah, that distance. Yeah, rather than trying to sit there flying along going. That three, distance to Robert is the base yeah. of Robert, it's not any further up the ridge. Yeah, that's true. We're not talking about millimetres. Um, but right. Remember that's five nautical yeah. miles. Just go five, ten, fifteen, twenty. You know? I think I think another thing too is um, when you're driving to Lake Station, have a look out the window and, and you'll see the rocks. You know, you're coming, um, you cross the Potter River on the bridge and come up the first line of paddocks, and they're all full of rocks. Yeah, of rocks. You don't then, want it in there. then you actually get an ownership change. And some years ago, they went out there and laboriously picked all the rocks out of the paddocks. Wow. Suddenly, you get paddocks with no rocks. So, you kind of want to know when those no rock paddocks start because, That's why it's you know, if you're, everything goes turns to custard, you've got to get to one of those no rock paddocks. That's why it's amazing. Sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> We're covering the rocks and the paddocks. We've got to hear rock stop at tree. Oh, so, any more on that? 
Because that is a QGP exam question. How far can you go? And that ain't enough in the mountains. Okay? But that's a reasonably, it's three, it's somewhere between three and five miles. That's on the airplane. But just, I use five because that's five miles long. So I go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet, and I use it in Australia as well. So it's a worthwhile thing to know because if your computer says that you're going to make it with heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of height, and you go 5, 10, 15, and it's different worlds, somebody's wrong. That ain't wrong. <laughs> Don't trust your technology when you're able to use your technology, which is not yet. You're only going to go the way. Right. Well, can, I, can I ask? Yeah. Um, really, I mean, if you're over on the Robert Face or St. Island, there's actually nowhere to land until you're pretty well back to the airfield anyway. There is. No. Oh, unless you use borders. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the answer is there's not a problem with that landing because you're staying within 21. Remember, yeah, I know no, we've okay. got solo people okay. here, so I apologise to those guys. Sorry. You will yeah. stay within 20 to 1, okay? We're responsible for you when you are flying. Mm -hmm. You have to stay within 20 to 1. If you're over on that, on that Sonata at 4,000 feet, you're out of that zone, okay? That means back on checks and where mm -hmm. I get from, all right? Until mm -hmm. you can do it, because yeah. you kill yourself, we end up going to jail, you know? It's going to happen in this country. Right. Item seven. You ask, what is the best way to optimize your glide ratio? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Open your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who has seen this graph before? Yeah. Nobody. Is that yeah, dragon speed? Dragon, 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 dragon speed. Dragon yeah. 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 <laughs> speed. More speed, more drag. Ah. Yeah. More speed, more drag, you think? Yes and no. So we've got two types of drag. We've got induced drag, which does that increase or decrease with speed? Oh, I'll check you. Yeah. you okay. that what was the question? <laughs> uh, does, it, does it increase? Does induced drag decrease or increase the speed? Yeah. It decreases with speed. So that's probably this one, is it? Sure. Okay. Now, dr induced drag is caused by the angle of attack and the amount of lift that's being created. The more your angle of attack, the more induced drag, because the wing's working harder and harder and harder and harder, so all the vortices on the end of the wing, etc., etc., are falling off and making you work harder, etc., etc. So the um, faster you go, or the, the lower your angle of attack, so you know you've got your wing section like that, so your angle of attack is the angle that the airfoil goes up, so the more you stick the nose down, the less induced drag you get. However, is a, this one is called profile drag. I can't spell it, but it's called profile drag. Okay? And it's the same as picking, putting your hand out the window when you're going down the car. The first you go, the more it pushes your hand back. Okay? Yeah. It's quite simple. But there's a sweet spot where the induced, the induced drag is going down and down and down, and the Profile drag is going up and up and up, but there is a happy spot there where it is the minimum. It is the best lift over drag. So remember, we always talk about L over D equals you know, lift over drag. But that is your L. That is how you calculate out where your best glide angle is. Not minimum sink. We'll go into all that one later. Glide angle. And on. On the, on the grobs, it's, what is it, it's about 56. 56. Oh, like Most gliders are somewhere between 55 and 60. Okay? It's about 55 knots. Okay? So, to go anywhere, you fly at 55 knots, not minimum sink. 
because that's the least amount of profile drag and the least amount of induced drag. Okay. People understand that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That used to be a question in the old ones. Okay, so remember that number. Okay, now polar curves. Tell me if I'm boring you and you want to stop or it's not, not interesting or anything. I think it's stop. Okay, polar curves. They are in the flight manual of both throttles, which I didn't bring with me because I'm using it as a repair manual at the moment. So along there we have again, we have speed again, and here we have sink and lift. Not that you want to lift because the gliders don't go up on their own, do they? Okay. So we've got speeds going along like this, and we'll start at say, uh, we'll start at 30, 40. 50, 55, <laughs> 60, because that's our magic number, 70, 80, and 90. Okay, so, tell me if other people know or know this already. So, what speed is the minimum sink in our props? Okay, it's not 55, no. it's around, it's, it's, it's around the 50. We'll keep it at 50 because then it makes it easy for me to draw the So, and our sink rate is here, so it's minus 1, minus 2, minus 300. This is all hundreds of feet a minute because again, you're working all those figures in feet per minute. Okay, so our grog at 50 knots is sinking usually about 150 feet a minute. Is that better? We'll, we'll assume it is. So it's there. Okay. What happens if we fly slower? If we fly at 40 knots, what does the glider do? Sinks. Sinks, yeah. So at 40 knots, our sink rate is down here. Yeah. And if you fly it at 36 knots, the stall is probably down here. I did, again, I've done it with several of you, you're just above the stall, and those areas are boom, down there, aren't they? Because you, you're not stalled, but everything's falling out of the sky. Okay. So if we fly the 55 knots, which was our favourite one, um, are we going to be going up or down on that one? Okay, that way. 60 knots? 70 knots? 80 knots? 90 knots? They're getting steeper because the glider, you know, the gliders um, the, flying so far away from it, where it's supposed to be flying, the sink rate at 100 knots is probably like 600 feet a minute, you know? I'll just get rid of that one to make it look nice and pretty pigeon. And then what some clever person does who's got the ability to work in mathematics, well, that is called the power curve. Okay? You've seen them on hang gliders, mm -hmm. probably like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they're here. Because <laughs> you don't... Okay. But, this yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> they show up. <laughs> okay, so that is the polar curve. That picture is in the flight manual. Okay. A question for type ratings is what's the rate of sink at 80 knots? So you go along, you give yourself a ruler, and you go three and a half knots. Okay, and that's how you work out what your rate of sink is. Or Best, remember our favourite little one? The one we did with this one and this one, it was at 57 knots or something like that. That's there. That works out as a tangent to the polar curve starting at zero. Now you're all going to fall asleep now. But that is where, and the angle of that is amazingly whatever the glide angle of the glider is, is 35. So the polar curve is worked out by spending a lot of money on aerotoes and doing 20 or 30 flights at 50 knots, 60 knots, 70 knots, and someone's in the back writing down the red, and they get a whole array of dots all over the place, and then they draw the mean average or whatever it is through the middle. And that's how they come up with that. Modern gliders go like this. They go much faster before they start going down. My old wooden glider does that. But we'll just stick with. I think one of the problems with the grog is that washout, isn't it? On the, on the wing cups. 
So, best speed to fly when you're on the ridge is what? Question you had a bit later on. So, if you're flying in lift, you want to be flying here. Okay? So, where the yellow triangle is. It's different for everybody. Yeah, but an hour is greater than approximately 50. But that's at zero G. Start turning, G goes up. At zero G or one G? This is zero G. Sorry, one, one G. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, we're, we're not, we're not yet. I was like, mate. Right, yeah. At one G, the best way to fly a glider is, a, is uh, to go up is at 50 knots with the wings level. Best way to go from the ridge, from the winch to the ridge is not at that speed, it's that speed. You are coming down a bit faster, okay? You're coming down half a knot faster, but you're going forwards. Better. Yeah. The tangent will line just the ratio, isn't it? It's just the tangent will line just the ratio. It's the best mix that, of the yeah. best mix of forward to sinking. It is, it's the best seller to do because, yeah, and it works out of that, etc. And then we'll start moving around in a minute. But so when you come off of the winch, going back to the very first thing that Frank said, you do not fly to the ridge, and AJ, we tend to float around at this speed as well, which is a complete waste of time. Um, you won't get there. You'll just sit and watch the ridge come up. I sit in the back quite often and just think, no, dear, you know, you'll fly faster, and they haven't got that bit yet. So it's important to fly to the ridge at least at that speed, okay? It is, if you are flying in sync, this whole lot goes down, and you draw the new polar curve, and the new speed to fly is there. So if you're going down at two knots more, which I've moved that polar pound down two knots, you've got to fly at 60, 65 knots. We're running out of time, are we? No, you want to Right. And does anybody want to know any more about more the polar curve? Is, would, you, would you put into account hit wind? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. the whole figure for the beginning? Uh, there is one, and I can't remember what it is. Okay, 20 to 1. Just remember 20 to 1, because yeah. that covers a lot of things. Yes, what happens with the head wind is it, 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 it effectively does that. I think it moves everything. That way. You'd want to go faster, yeah. wouldn't you? So you're less, ex yeah, you're less yeah. exposed than yeah. in the headwind. I think what you do is you take your, this is zero knots here, I think you take it from the headwind yeah. and it takes it up a little bit. Yeah. There is a number, but, but really, don't get, this is where the theory comes from, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't get hanging around with it. Fly on the ridge at 50, fly to the ridge at somewhere between 55 and 65. There's bugger all difference between the sink rates between like 50 and 60, it's half a knot, right? But you get there five knots quicker, okay? So somewhere between 55 and 60 will do, but not 45. And yes, if you've got a headwind, yeah, 60 as opposed to 55. But we're flying <coughs> safe speed near the ground. The best, that's the yellow triangle plus half the wind speed plus the layout to the final. Mm. That's what's in the move, isn't it? Mm. So if you're flying close to the ridge, it should be yellow triangle plus half a wind speed. At least. No stalls. So we're, we're at 10,000 feet in the thermal. Because okay. yeah. he's absolutely right. We haven't, I'm not even covering safe speed in the ground here, but he's correct. If less than 500 feet above the ground, you need to be doing safe speed into the ground. Yeah. And, what, and what the mood will say is yellow triangle. Plus, 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 pl
That's half the wind speed. It's another form. But that's it, we've got the inner triangle. I, I, I like it. I, I think it's a good idea. It's terrible if you've done yes, the inner triangle and you right. haven't calibrated the ASI. So <laughs> I'm afraid I don't agree with so you've got to go install the glider and then figure it out from there. But as but that's he's absolutely right. That's what we're supposed to teach you. I will never teach you that. Okay. So I can't even remember the only four. Stall plus ten plus half wind speed is nice and easy. Because you should know what the glider stalls at. You should be storing it in something very certain place. Mm. And that is a good one near the ground as well. If we did what it says in the book, we'd be landing at 60 knots and still yeah. it, which is why I don't use it. Okay. No, no, the book used to say that. Oh, I now say it's triangle. I've resigned as an instructor, that's why I don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're still that's trying to change that's something that's that doesn't need changing, in my view, but if you have to do what it says in the middle, book, if you should do exactly what it says. Okay? And you will pass if you do what it says in the book. I don't know about yellow triangles. I haven't got one in my diary. It's the safe, the slowest speed that you can land a glider at maximum uh, all up weight. In still, in still air. Yeah. And if you do it in CX, you'll crash. Yeah. Because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Which is why you do it that way. If you try and land that CX at the yellow triangle, which is for it under it just, just goes coating. crash, yeah. and it's down my workshop for inspection. It is wrong. Now, whether that is because the SPD is wrong, I don't know, which is the problem with using the yellow triangle because we don't calibrate SPD indicators in this country. Mm. Right, any more questions on polar curves? Because yeah. you need to know some of that, I think, for every two years. Yeah. Mm. I'm not disagreeing with Mike. Yeah, I try and see it. Oh, yeah. It's just kind of it's, it's absolutely right. right. The, the, the model does say you're one, right? But there's a lot of dodgy things in there. Are Piggott's books still relevant? Who? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. What's so, still relevant? Piggott's. Yes. What? There's what? There's an even better one there. There's somebody called oh. Lester Piggott who wrote. Oh, Derek. 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 Sorry. <laughs> who, who wrote. <laughs> <laughs> you described the man, right? I haven't seen my own. Ah, yes. They were the most. He's just a good slide, I think. It's good. But, but he did things in, simple, in a simple mm -hmm. manner. Yeah. Know? I mean, this book's first class. Sure. Um, but are, they still, are they still available? Or this one, there's a copy of it in the Bloomington. Right, not yet. It's a copy. read the first part of it, not the max. It yeah. tells you everything that I've told you so far, including what to do with headwinds, mm -hmm. what to do with tailwinds, and speed to fly. And ridge soaring, and wave soaring, and thermal flying, and there are lots of things you don't use anymore, like um, taking pictures and stuff like that. But you're not at that. By all means, read it. But you need to be doing exactly what Frank said. Find the end. It's You know, and then try and remember what we've said. Okay. Safe out landings. What? What's the question? Safe out landings. Question number nine. Uh, number eight, sorry, is what is the best route to start with as a beginner? Go back to the 10 nautical miles and then we'll go on to the paddocks that you can land in if you're in the shit. Um, well, I've got a yeah, so in order to, um, the next one is cross country pilot, isn't it? Getting towards cross country pilot. And you have to fly a 50k fly. Mm -hmm. And um, somewhere along there, you have to plan a flight that has land outs that are no more than 10 k's apart. So in order to satisfy that, I think at our site, we can do it. We've got the one tree paddock. You, you, you talked about there being nowhere to land um, from the Robert Bridge. Uh, if, if you're on Sananas, you've got the one tree paddock. Do you know that one? That one? Yeah. No, it's the one tree paddock. horse paddock. Yeah, it's got horses in it. <laughs> when, when you, um, you don't come from Nelson same, and, you, and you get the T intersection at the top out, so you turn left of Venom or right to Nelson. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mon right money the, free New Zealand. Yeah. yeah, and you go along, they're not very far, and there's a 
the first decent paddock on your oh, right. Horse paddocks on the right. Okay. Yeah, After the, the pigs. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. got a big, a big hoarding and a money, no money, New Zealand or something. Money yeah. free New Zealand. Yeah. 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 Osmondston. Oh, 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 Richard Osmondston owns it. Yeah. Yeah. That very long paddock, or you turn left to left. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the first first it's down first there. Pad. That's the sloping down. Correct. Yeah, isn't it? That's correct, yes. It's yeah, it's sloping down. Right well, it's yeah. sloping up this. Right. Yeah, that's really supposed to go the other direction. Well, these are going to some turn at all. If you're landing in them, you really made a mistake because you are 20 to 1 to get the air field. Yeah. 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 Question was what's the best route. <coughs> so, so it's a darker so pen, please, Frank. It's invisible. And, and you're quite right that there's power lines along here somewhere. Correct. And also it, it slopes uphill there. So it's a, it's a one way strip. You know, you've got to do a planned circuit. Ideally, this way. I've landed it three times. You come around and land there. Now, normally, it's a decent southwest wind line, you, you'd have a tailwind which would be no good. But if there's decent wind, the snarlers are working, so you're probably not going to need to use it. People have landed there, landed there in calm winds, because you know, it doesn't work in the reach. Um, there's that one, and then... Are there all these horses in there, though? Because the times uh, I've been past, there's all these horses. Not always. Pigs, horses, long grass. Yeah. Long At the end of yeah. the day, yeah. that's yeah. all you've got. Yeah, that's what you get. She's going. Yeah. So, so I'm just trying to, we're getting ahead of it here, but these 10k part paddocks, yeah, airstrips, uh, there's that one. And then there's the rainbow station airstrip that we call the ball paddock. Where's that? You guys know that? I know where the turn off to rainbow Well, definitely the shit if you're in that one. <laughs> when, when you, um, <laughs> that's about, about that five kilometres so down towards Blenheim. Yeah. Yeah. So you go, so the rainbow turn off's on the right, you keep going. Down the hill? Yes, yes, yeah. you go all the way down the hill. So that's for, there's a turn off to blow somewhere around here, is isn't it? Well, oh, they haven't gone that far. Oh, you've not gone that far. It's a turn off to the lake station. 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 And pretty much straight away, it's there on your right. And it's the letterbox is all at the Rainbow Homestead. And um, it's a fertiliser airstrip there and fertiliser bin. So we've got that one, we've got the one tree, and then we've got Lake Station. I think these are all decent in case part. And then we've got one in the Howard, the, the, the lower Howard, we call it. And it's up on a terrace. And, and it's a decent farm and airstrip. It's got a hay farm. And then we've got, over the ridge, we've got the Gowan Valley. And there's another farm and airstrip in the Gowan Valley. And then you guys are getting the familiar territory now with the That's Mount it. Murchison. And then we've got Mount Murchison. And just west of Mount Murchison, we've got what we call the Owen Paddocks. There's, there's a number of paddocks here that power upon this river landing and power gliders. So oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so those Owen Paddocks. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a little bit hazy, but, but where the, I think between Owen Paddocks and Mount and Murks and Airstrip, it's too far away. Um, it's probably more than 10 k's, isn't it? Yeah. No, yeah. No. yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know there's any decent flat paddock. You know, it's all humpy dumpy land that I can see. Uh, yeah. so, uh, these, these paddocks that we're saying, you need to know where they are because yeah. you might get like something go wrong. You yeah. might have an air brake come out and stick out with that. Okay. You could have problem. something that is not your fault. Yeah. You might need to make an emergency landing. Yeah. These are the best paddocks. It doesn't matter whether they got cows in them. It does, you know, because there yeah. is no other paddock yeah. Yeah. in that area. That's okay. Right. Yeah. It's the same with um, with bull paddock. It's probably got crop on it, which is higher than the wingtips. It doesn't matter because that's a safe place that you will walk away from. Okay. Right. The Howard paddock again. If you get dumped at the top of the Robert Bridge, you go all the way to the end. Of Catherine was saying lately, and I've landed in it in my Zulu, and it's uh, not very easy. 
Okay. Oh, I, I wasn't talking about that one, I was talking about the lower one. Oh, the lower ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first one you come to within your 10k, up by, so you're up by the, you know, the, the lodge, the, lower the lodge or whatever it's down called, the top of the mount rail to rail, you're quite happy and the air brakes get stuck out, that's your closest one. And then you fly on down the valley and right pretty soon, mm -hmm. there's, there's, it gets better and better. Okay? But it's really important, yeah. you can't fly that puts you in that situation. You yeah. really can't. Okay? Um, yeah, that's it's a it. very stressful thing. I've done 200 out landings and every one I've got to think about. Sorry. So that, that one Mike's talking about, the, about, I call it the head of the Howard. It's really worth one getting in, getting to know straight away because it, it covers a huge area when you start cross country flying. There's a huge lot of mountains there, but the closest is one to land is there. And, and it's been used, I think, three times. I don't know. Mike's used it once. I've used it as a and Ken I was very happy up by Mount Traverse, and the wave got out of phase with the ridge and suddenly was going down. And I was looking to land on the top of Lake Road. I was 6,000 feet at Mount Traverse, right? If you do your maths, that's about okay. And okay, came for 20 to 1, nearly didn't make it. Yeah, Terrible. Scary. Because everything just went like that. <laughs> And I got there at 700 feet above the pad, and I knew it was there, so I landed it. Mm. So have a think of where they are. Don't don't trouble yourself at the moment. Yeah. Have a look where they are when you're floating around within your 10k. Mm. But those are the only ones, and uh, you'll need to know where they are before you can do a cross country. But mm. at the moment, they're for if someone's gone wrong, mm. okay, or you really have made a mistake. Which gets back to having something a map, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mark them on the map. Well, we have, we have the land out book which has got maps in it. But the other thing that's quite good is you can go on Google Earth, put in the Latin long, mm -hmm. and then go and fly, part, fly by them if you like. Oh, have a look at them and, and work out the, how they relate to the landscape. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the line of the poplar trees or a fertiliser bin. Yeah, that's right. And, and the one that I forgot to say was as Frank's covered it when you come in from the village. The, it's rocks, 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 and then you get to a lone tree on the left-hand side. That's where the rocks stop. Okay, just before where Malcolm's building his new house. Yeah. Okay, that's where the rocks stop. You cannot <coughs> land between the ridge, between the lake, and that tree. They are boulders like that. They're glacial moraine. Okay, so you've got to be 20 to one. Like when I'm flying on the ridge, there, I'm making sure I'm 20 to one to there. Okay. That's what I'm doing. You're making sure you're 20 to 1 to the you're ridge. Landing. Okay? Yes. Mm. But I don't go out of flight range of that one, even to this day. Mm. Okay? Various. Mm -hmm. You've asked me yeah. what's the difference between mechanical and electric. You've all seen these before, because these are out of Alpha Julia. Mm -hmm. And that one is the one that's in, that came out of the November Hotel. That's what's in my Zulu at the moment but the little knobby thing was over here because it broke. Okay. So, mechanical vario. Does everybody know how they work? No? Very simple. There's a thermos flask. It used to be a thermos flask. In fact, I've still got a thermos flask. And at the top, there's a pipe. And it goes into the variometer. Okay, there are... And, it, and the variometer's got one, two, three, four, five. Is that, is that there? And it goes into one of the pipes on the back, and the other pipe goes for the little tube that sticks out the back of the fuselage. Uh, it's called the total energy tube. Now it can either come out vertically out of the fuselage, or it can be down like that out of the fin on NH and CX. Okay? What that is, that's got holes in the back of it. So don't put this one around the wrong way. This one's got a funny looking Venturi thing here, but what it does is it creates a vacuum. Directly proportional to the speed that you fly. It's not a static. Static are the little holes in the side. That means the static. So the pressure on a static is always the same. It's static. It's nothing. It's just there. So certain instruments are connected to the static, which is the airspeed, uh, the um, altimeter is. Okay? But the variometer is connected to the total energy tube in the back or total energy tube in the thin there. This is a vacuum flask, a thermos flask, because it's insulated, okay? It's got a volume of a half a litre, or 0.45 litres, and it's surrounded by steel wall. The reason being is that if you 
if it wasn't insulated and you touched it, you would warm the air up in there and it will come rushing out because it's got hot, like our thermal does at the beginning of the day. So that's why they're insulated. Okay? And what happens when you're going along and you're sinking on our polar curve? So we're on our polar curve again, we're going along at 56 knots and we're going down at 2 knots, aren't we? That's because we're sinking. And what happens to the air pressure when we're sinking? Increases. Increases, correct. So what, when we're going down, the air will flow into that tube. It'll go through this, which is a flow meter, that one. And it'll work out where we go down at. And then it'll start filling the vacuum flask up. Okay? Right, yeah, that is the right way around. If you go through the no, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so it either comes out that way. Now, when you're going up, the air wants to come out of our little flask because it's one atmosphere on the bottom here, and therefore it goes out that way. The needle goes up, and then it evacuates out through there. This is this. The reason it's total energy is it takes account of the speed you're flying at. The faster you go, the bigger the vacuum. Okay, so it gets rid of the push and the pull, the acceleration. It's the total energy, it works out kinetic potential energy. Okay? If you connected it to the statics in the side there, if you stick the nose over, your rate of, in, of uh, sink quickly increases, doesn't it? And it goes and then and then it and then it stabilizes and then it goes back. So what this does, when you push the stick forward, it should just gently go down to four knots down and not go off the clock and then settle at four. Total energy. Okay? That's right. Right. <laughs> That's what this variometer does here. And it is. have a little tiny little hole somewhere to keep what I see Inside. Inside. No, some of yeah. them. So then, shouldn't there always be a difference in always reading something? Or would it have to equalize? It has to be something. It has to. Once you're, once you're leveled off and not doing anything, it has to yeah. equalize. There's no flow. Otherwise, it will There's read. No flow. There's no flow. There's no flow. Yeah. So it's, it's literally just a flow meter. It's a flow meter. That's it. Yeah. A very, <laughs> hey, there you go. Very sensitive VSI. Right. Right. Very sensitive VSI. Interesting. Okay. One of them says 0.45 liters. So that's the one that goes to the flask. And the other one is static. It's stacked or oh. static. Mister. Yeah. So it's, it's more the vacuum's here to create a flow of air that moves it's over the port to show you rather than just. So we've said it wrong. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's it. But to make this go up or down, you have to firstly go up, then the air has got to decide it's going to go out, and then it's got to travel from the thermos flask, which is down by your feet, through the instrument panel, halfway down the fuse ladder. Now it takes about three seconds, which is why to find back the thermal end, use your arse. Okay, oh, that's, that's three seconds behind. So when you are thermally, think three seconds ahead. Think of where it's going to say in three seconds time. Go around once and it goes. So when it hit maximum, think three seconds before, and that's when you were in the real three knots. Of that. Okay. So that's a mechanical variometer. An electric <coughs> variometer is. This one is exactly the same. It has two button, two things on it. All it does, instead of being a flow meter here, is it's an electronic flow meter. Pressure Try transducer. resistors or... Like, pressure transducer. Um, some are pressure transducers. The ball gelt one that we've got covered yeah. is a pressure transducer. But that one is an electronic flow meter. Yeah. Right? So this is the difference. That one is a flow meter because it still uses a bottle. So it's still slow. But it goes beep, 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 ooh, okay. And, for, and there are different settings on here, volume. You've got a high amplitude, sine wave, and a low amplitude one. One's for fast response, one's for slow response. You've got times 0.5, so that means that 10 knots is actually 20 knots. So if you're in a really strong thermal, you can damp it down. Times one is one knot is one knot. And 20S is a 20 second average. So if you've been going around consistently and the variable is going 10 up, 3 down, 6 up, 5 up, if you hit that down, it's depressing. It'll tell you what you've actually averaged over the last 20 seconds, which is what you use for if you're going up or down. GNH has got a digital one, 
and there's a new one going in CX, which is digital as well. And the third type, which is exactly what you said, is a pressure transducer. It's a very sensitive altimeter. So when you go up, it realizes the pressure's gone like that, and it tells you that you're going up. They are the second fastest varios. They're the slowest. They're a little bit quicker. The pressure transducer one's a bit quicker, and now they're using G meter modules, all the things that are inside your phone and stuff like that. Yeah. That's the latest technology. Okay, and they're instant. The moment you feel that, it feels that, and says whoop, and everybody's three seconds behind and finding them really hard to use because <laughs> they're still they're still going one, two, three, turn. I should have turned three seconds ago. Okay, so those are your technologies. But does people understand this, this, this total energy thing here yeah. and static? So that's why you, that's why we have the tube, and that's why it must create a vacuum. That's why there's holes in the back. The faster you go, the more vacuum it creates, and it offsets the fact that you zooming down, so it comes zooming out, but it's put a bigger vacuum on. Sorry, you're going down, so it's zooming in, but you go faster, so it creates a bigger vacuum, so it stops it zooming in. That's how it works. It's just a bit of okay. magic. What do you need to know? Is this whole okay. Thing? You asked the question about minimum lift. We did cover it earlier. It was on the, which we have covered. What's the best route? Uh, variometers. Uh, what is the minimum lift the glider needs to maintain its height? All right. Polar curve. Fatty polar curve. You're going down at two knots, what do you think the minimum amount you need to stay neutral is? Two knots. Two knots. The glider is always going downhill. You are always flying downhill. You need to find air which is going up more than you're going down. And they're usually about one and a half, two knots. So your thermal, if you're going up at two knots, that means the air is actually rising up four knots. Because two knots to get you to nothing two knots to raise. And the electronic barriers can give you netto as well, but we will go into that as well. They can tell you what the air is doing if you want. They take the CX out. Mine's got that one. Well, CX is the big one as well. Right, what speed works? What's missing off of those variometers? Glider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I took them off purposely. In the tree room. These little things are unbelievable. So there, you will see that variometers have got this little McCready ring on them. Yeah. You get the good one, I get the one I can't read, usually in the back. Okay. And on there, if you pass it around, you'll see there is, I think I've set it. Yeah, I've set it, you can move it. And I've set it so that the triangle is pointing at zero. So have a quick squeeze. So, if the Vario was pointing, if you were sinking at 400 feet a minute, what's the little number opposite 400 feet a minute? See me. That's the speed you should be flying at. Okay? It's as simple as that. So what is it this run? Basically, it's, a, it's an adjustment so you're more efficient. If you're yeah. out at 400 feet a minute, the 70 lines up with it, so you fly oh, 70 knots. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, got it. It's point yeah. Yeah. Do you change it during the flight yeah. or not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's repeatable. Yeah. So yeah. I don't mean how to use it, but, but you, you put your marker arrow on whatever you put it on and it'll go, yeah, yeah, okay, if you're going down at 900 feet a minute, you fly 80 knots. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is so on zero, right? So, so when, we have, when we have the big, so we have the zero. triangle pointing at zero, yeah. okay? Yeah. And then the needle's pointing at, say, two knots, it tells you to fly at 50, 50 knots. Oh, amazing. What speed did we? Uh, three knots. 
three knots, for two and a half knots, it says 56 knots. Well, that was about the speed we said we had to fly to the ridge, wouldn't it? Because we're coming down at two knots, aren't we? It's all becoming clear now. So you have got your polar curve like that. The rig, now, Frank's right, you, it's a, what you're supposed to do is wind it to the anticipated next climb. Right, just erase this. Because that's the correct <laughs> speed to fly to the next thermal. If you think, you, you are bloody miracles if you know what the next, if you look at the next one, it's going to be six knots. You're supposed to wind the arrow to six knots, and then it tells you what speed to fly. Oh, Don't worry about it at the moment. Leave it on zero. I never winded that past two. Okay? Still wins the nationals doing that. That's so when you come off the wire and it's going down at eight knots, you should be doing 70, 73 knots. So that is how you use the three D rings. And so that's basically that's shifting the polar curve. Yeah. And it's, but it's just a practical way of shifting the polar curve so you fly the speed. Yeah. 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 You're in the yeah. polar curves down here. Yeah. The speed to fly is over here, and that is the best LO, uh, That's the best speed to fly for that rate of second. Somebody's worked that out. Oh, McCready. Yeah. 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 What a fantastic engineer. Yeah. The more you sing, the less time you want to spend. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not but if you go too fast, you come down too fast. Yeah. 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 It's all in there. It's all in there. Right. Any more questions on best speed to fly? This is one left. They're very fragile and they're about $1,000 each. So, we've got a new one coming yeah, for AJ, right. so you might get they some more reliable information really quick on trade with yeah. information <laughs> and AJ. Yeah. The AJ one is a pressure transducer, so it doesn't have a bottle it's and a it's a bit quicker. It's a pretty right. it's a pretty So, when you're flying, there's, there's three speeds you need to worry about. The right speed to fly in the lift, remembering safe speed near the ground. The right speed to go to the next little lift, so it's 50, 60, and then if you're sinking like mad, a bit faster, 70. Block, they call it, most people use block speeds, they call it, you know? 50, 60, 70. You know, if you're going down like clappers, 70. If you're going down, okay, 60. If you want to stay up, 50. If you just remember those three speeds, that's good enough. And plus or minus bugger all on the mold. Which is the difference, this is how you'll stay up. If you can't keep the speed within two or three knots at 50, you're, you're moving down the polar. You've got to work hard. If you're unable to keep the speed to that zone there, you've suddenly got to fly that much more lift to stay up because you'll go around the 70 knots. Well, you might need to go to 70 knots if it's rough, but that's another day. Okay. The last one was ratings. Yeah. I'll tell you my views and you can tell me your views. So I, think, I think in the past it's, it's just been a judgment call on the instructor panel about people progressing from one aircraft to the next. So, you know, the LS4 is the expensive glider that's the many authority figures in the club are anxious to preserve its integrity to get it structure so on. And, so you need to make good landings, you need to um, be aware that the, that, that glider doesn't have a nose wheel. So you can have a landing and, and pulling back on the stick, hold off, hold off, and, and you run along the ground and you pull that stick all the way back. You know, should stick, be doing stick it poly anyway. held back, you should be doing this in all the gliders. You should finish your ground run. Or, but you stick fully held back. Mm -hmm. You should have stuck fully held back well before you finish the ground running. Mean. Um, I'm not sure what else I can say. Is, is, is there not a monumental leap in performance from the from the Astia to an LS4? No. Well, well, the Astia's fly pretty nicely when they only got one. That's brilliant. Person. I was thinking of single steps. I, I like the twin steps. Oh, you mean the single step? Yeah. yeah. All, all of our gliders are nice to fly. The LS4 is the easiest to fly. It's the easiest to damage. Hardest. It's the easiest to get wrong. Hardest to land. It doesn't land on the yellow triangle. 
it's got very low wing tips that scrape along the ground. It's got a flock canopy. It's got expensive instruments. The list is endless. Okay. Basically, the way I saw it here was to go from one to the other, the Moodle says it's about 15 launches, approximately one half hours, isn't it? I think it says. But really, if you're not on our radar when you're flying solo, oh, it's Mark coming in the circuit, oh, he's fine. When you get that sort of conversation, oh, look at that lovely landing, then you're ready to move on. Two things I would like to see, this is not the gun balls, all right? I want to see you be able to rig them and de-rig them before you fly them, because you might land them out, okay? You must read the flight manual, and there is a quiz that we developed down in the Mariner, which I've got that asks you what's the minimum sink of knots, where's the undercarriage lever, what speed, you know, it's a very simple quiz, it's an open book quiz. Okay, so really it's off the instructor's radar. Uh, current, been up there more than six months ago, you know, there's a whole load of boxes that we need to tick. Um, and to be able to rig it, de-rig it, which we did on Sunday for several people, did a bit of a session. And uh, do the type rating quiz and make sure that you get a good briefing from somebody that's very current in it or an instructor. And then to move up to GCX, it's another level of game. You can turn GNH around with the wing on the ground, it's not the end of the world, it's bad practice, but it's got a great big steel skid. If you do that with GNH, I might get upset. If you leave the canopy open, they break. I've just replaced the canopy, it's $26,000, all right? Replace the canopy, so don't break, you know? Um, you've got undercarriage, so when I just sit in the back and they go, uh, undercarriage, oh, not fitted, not required, skip this, skip over it. You end up doing that, an airplane with any So I get annoyed when I tell people to just look. And the same with the flaps. You know, one day you'll go not fitted, not required, and you've actually got it. And, uh, yeah. So you've got undercarriage on, and you've got water bars, you've got fragile, you've got everything. But to be honest, the LS4 is the easiest one of the lot to fly. It goes further, 20 to 1 is a breeze. You know, you'll leave the scenario at 4,500 feet, and you'll get back at 3,500. It's a real breeze. It's got a bit of a pain in the ass wheel brake, you know, whereas GNH has got a lovely wheel brake. But, um, yeah, make sure you're not on the instructor's radar. If you do go on radar, like I used to when I was 16 years old, don't be upset if I say you're back on that one or come and blow with me, you know? I'm doing it because I need you to be safe. You know? I've got no reason to stop you flying CX, I don't want to fix it. But really, I'm doing it because you did something silly, a low circuit. You turned too low off of the winch, you know, brake. You landed with the brakes fully out, too slow, and it goes crash, bang, you know. And I've seen, we've got a few people that have landed it by the carrier landing, you know, and it really does. It's got a very small wing, so really it doesn't have the grain effect that the rods have got. Definitely, that drag the wings and cracked. What about passenger ratings? I'd like to take my wife flying one day. Where does that fit into the club and the legal syllabus sil matrix? Um, that's a tricky one. Yeah, no, even, they, if, they even, if, wife? even if even yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of someone else. Can you go home? I'm sick of food. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, well, 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 obviously, it's not something I want to try and go spearing off cross country, but even sort of a trip around the circuit, you know. When um, when does a passenger rating? It's a good piece. When is when is it something? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole section of the movie about it, I think, and we, um, Ollie went through it all. Yeah, yeah. and I've had a look at it, it's the old classic, you know, when you first start taking passengers, like you can tell if they're nervous, when they go quiet, it's a bad sign, that sort of stuff. Is it, yeah. is there, is it an, an hour requirement, a licence requirement, or is it a, do you know how to not go and frighten someone half to death, and if you're on the lip, someone go in the back? How does it work? Was it no, it's a rating, yeah, isn't it? It's, it's a rating, but it's a rating. Yeah, yeah. One of the things is you've got to get the fucking proper purpose. The person in a qualification should probably got in the Surprisingly. I mean, you've got to be solid. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> is it not part of the. It used to be the QGP, which is yeah. the PPL for Global Pilots. Yeah. There yeah. was a specific section in there. 
which yeah. was for passenger ratings. The new sex thing is called XCP. Yeah. I think you've got to, have you got to have that? No, no, no you, you, you get a passenger rating before you get an XCP. Right, okay. so they've made it. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's in, if you read the pilot training program, the PTP on the GNZ website, it will yeah. tell you exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, because some of the old one you go to, it's got hours, and the next one it seems to sort of read like, Frank's happy then. Frank signs the book and off you go and you have a nice time sort of thing. It's, it's no, it's a bit more. Yeah, so, so have you read it in Moodle? Have you, have you yeah, I started looking about the requirements and, and it's a lot of talking about that theory of, you know, you'll get the, the overconfident pilot, the underconfident pilot, the passenger who's very nervous, how you should brief the person. Are they a pilot yeah, yeah. themselves? Are they yeah. not? It's, it's, it's all that stuff that, yeah. uh, with a bit of experience that I'm, I'm quite familiar with it. Familiar so, with so it's not like I'm going to go out there and be like, watch this, we're going to skim down this ridge at five feet off the ridge and I'm going to roll it, up, roll it upside down and the person in the back's going, please let me out. It's yeah, but you were already a CPL instructor in small planes, aren't you? At, 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 at one time, yes. Yeah. Those things, yeah. At one time. So he's done every tick in the box on how to calm people down. So it's just a yeah, yeah. gliding. Yeah. yeah, so that's the thing. That's the thing I'm sort of asking. Is it like you still have to? Not that I want to take short but if oh, I'm wondering nice. where it comes. Do I need to do a hundred hours on a glider, or can I take my wife around the circuit once I'm well, need to have consolidated a solo? You need a passenger rating. Yeah. Which yeah. you get more intensive medical fit from a So you've done all the training about how to calm them down before they take off. So you just got to convert it to gliding. So I'm sure you get one. Right. Yeah, yeah. The, the mood all the way it reads, it doesn't take into account people who, who might have other aviation experience. And it would certainly need the cross country qualifications, with the exception of the 50 kilometre flight. So that means you need obviously the solo, the soaring, and the cross country pilot. Yeah. 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 So it is the QDP equivalent. So it's. So essentially there's no quick route to it. You still have to go through oh, yeah. difficult and top. Yeah, yeah, I guess Ollie is. Well, Ollie went on the old scheme. Yeah, yeah. 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 The plan was to get the QGP and then have it converted to these. Mike, there's one thing we must talk about lift before is convergence. Because we get a lot of convergence, and uh, we've had some good convergence flying this season. Um, <coughs> so. Yeah, well, the Eskimo's got 10 words for snow, so there should be 10 words for convergence. Yeah. 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 Well, in this country. I mean, just, just an example, we had an easterly about six weeks ago, and we were taking off from the, west, from the western end of the strip, and there was no wind there, there was a... There was a Easterly at the other end, and it was really soggy taking off. And I took off and got into um, convergence straight off the winch and flew around in it for an hour and 20 minutes. And that was just the convergence between that easterly wind that was beating through the village and something coming from the west. But there's, there's yeah. all sorts of convergence and things set it up. How often does the sea breeze come in as far as? Quite a lot. That's a big source of it. Uh, the, the, yeah, that's right. So our strip is not uncommon to, to drive out to Lake Station and drive through Sonana, coming down in Sonana. It's a lot of wind, a lot of um, easterly, a lot of wind behind us. You know. mm. And then you get out in the strip and it's calm. Mm. And, you know, because we think, oh, we've got to launch 1-1. One, one. We get the strip on over and do the normal 2-9 and launch it. So and so, so the, you know, that... That's a sign where there'll likely be a convergence somewhere in the valley, mm. close to the strip. Yeah. So, so is that sort of conversion. The, there's this other one that, that, that I think is sort of worth quickly talking about. You, you've got the Robert Bridge here and, and, and the lake, lake here. And, um, and the um, Maggie Ridge there. So you've got... You've, this, this here is the Port of Valley. So you can imagine a south west wind coming from um, you know, the west coast, coming across Mount Mantle. You know Mount Mantle? It's sort of the last 
decent mountain, and then there's a lot of that flat land what you're talking about, all the way across un until you get to Robert Road. So we've got this westerly one coming across here. Now, if, particularly if there's an inversion, that, that wind is going to want to go this way. So, so it's going to hit the Robert Ridge. See, the Robert Ridge is not a great soaring ridge, in my opinion. And um, never had a lot of luck on the Robert Bridge, generally speaking. The Sonatas will work better than the Robert, typically, because of this problem of the wind running along it too much. Okay. Um, but the same wind is, is then on Karmateri or somewhere. It's getting funneled in the valley. It's, it's flowing, um, you know, we're taking off into the wind at Lake Station, in the headwind. And it, it's the same wind, and it, um, it gets... It meets around here, and it, it, it's a convergence thermal. Or it, it's a good place to often get away. We're about to the, break. Well, okay. well, it's a spear grass um, oh, yeah. creek. Spear grass creek comes out. So, if, if that's the Robert Ridge there, spear grass creek comes out, and, and then it's got a sort of a bend in it. A little a bend in the creek is often the place where it is. And there's the car park there, and, and the Maggie Ridge is there. So if you're sort of creeping along the Maggie Ridge and staying on top and only just, sometimes it's worth just coming out and here and running through this area here before you, with enough height, get back to Lake Station. Because quite a few picks up there in the car park, some of the car park in there. You know just when you're in it. Because you're thermoing and you're drifting, then you stop drifting. Mm. So you're drifting off of the ridge because of the southwesterly, and you'll go over there, as I said, over to the, the old car park at the bottom of Mount Robert Ridge, that sort of area, and you've got all the winds coming in and converging, mm. and then suddenly you just go up, and there's this one spot, and you just stay there. Mm. But the, the, who's seen that um, YouTube we put on? You know the club's got a channel yeah. Yeah, on YouTube? Nice. It's cool. Nelson Lakes GC. Nelson Lakes GC. On YouTube. YouTube channel. And it's got quite a number of instructional videos. Oh. And one of them there is long. Doing the end of circles and ending up in that thermal there. And, and, and it's interesting because he, he's doing thermals um, close to close to the winch, you know, close to the airfield. And he's drifting in the thermals, then coming forward and finding them again. He's gaining very little height, but he's working hard, he is gaining height, and he comes and he doesn't quite make it, he comes back and he's drifting in these thermals. And, and, and then he finally sort of gets to this place, the magic place that he's been heading for all day. And he goes up, and, but the thing is, he goes up straight. There's no drift on it. And then he goes across onto the top of Robert Ridge. <laughs> And he picks up another thermal and he's back in the wind flow again and on a big drift. Mm. <laughs> Isn't it possible that we had this in Paraguay that you get sea breeze coming down from Lennon? You get at some stage the sea breeze coming up along the, the BBs and then you get the southwester coming the other direction. So right in the middle at the end of uh, on our range where everything sometimes goes up like shit amazingly and, yeah. and you know what is that's well, what you're talking about the we one don't know where it comes from not that one the one that you're talking about which is the one that you will more likely get into what happens at the end of the day is that we've had a southwest wind all day so we're correcting to the left to the left and suddenly the wind stops will start to come around and this is the wind shear they'll start showing a northerly drift okay yeah. That's because the sea air is coming from Nelson, okay, and going on here. We've still got a southwest wind up here, yeah. and we've got a west uh, northerly wind mm. down here. This air is cold and damp, okay? This is nice and air. And this is the Sonarnas, and this is Mount, Mount Owen here. So we're taking cross-section through, through there. You've got the ground there. You've got the cold air coming along like that, blowing that way, this air. And you've got the and you've got the warm air coming this way, and the cold air undercuts the warm air. Okay, and it goes up like that, and it and it tethers down to the ground. And this cold air, we call it the tongue of cold air, slowly comes in. And then when the wind stops change, 
that means that this area is in. So when the point we're having to correct, go to the river, go to the river, instead of go to the road, go to the road, that means the C area is in, okay? And usually, and you can see it, okay? So, and it goes up like this, and then you get a big sort of cloud like that, and you get what we call the dags hanging down here, and you'll get a step, okay? You get a big step like that, um, because, and it's about the other way, sorry. <laughs> Which side you go on? Yeah, the hot side. Yeah. So it's um, it's a step like that. So the air is coming up like that, and these are all little dangly bits going down here because this air is being forced to rise, and there's an absolute step. It can be 500 feet, and you fly here, and you can go from parachute rock to Mount Bowen easy, and that's something that you will be able to do quite easily. It tends to be a bit more later in the summer. Uh, we don't get it in the winter much, do we? And you know, you get a, so you've got the normal gradient wind and it's undercut by the sea air. And these are everywhere in this country. If you want to know about convergence, go and talk to Chris uh, Richards. He knows every single one in the country. And he can fly all around the country with okay? these. But it's obvious when you're up there because you're going along and you're looking down, there's this lid here, things hanging down here, and a vertical rock, you know, and I stick my left wing in there. You can go down there, you can go down there 70, 80 knots. It's lovely. Okay? Um, but what happens as the day goes, this slowly moves in. So the wind socks are like this, and then they go to that, and then you're correcting for drift to the right, because what's happening is this is slow, this ton of air is marching in, and in the end it's over towards um, mm. uh, the, 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 the other, uh, what's the other called? Mount right. Angelus, goes sort of, you can almost get to Angelus, and then goes. And it's a great big arc. And it goes all the way up to uh, Mount Owen, and then it bends around the corner, and you've been all the way to the Cobb Dam. And that sort of area, you can run it on there. Yeah. Just on, yeah, you can just, the whole thing's on convergence. Then you can jump over onto the west coast, and you can run down the west coast on the west coast convergence, because the sea air is coming in there. And then you get down to, I can't remember where, and then you cross the cross, that's what Chris has done. But it's, it's a very easy one, and it's dead smooth. And the trick is to just climb up into it, and then you can just run along it. You'll see it. You'll think it's weight, but it's not. It's convergence. The big telltale is what we said right there. You thermal here, you go this way. You you want thermal here because this is all dead, okay? But you go that way. You thermal there, you go straight up. So you just hang around in there, but just watch it because it's quite narrow, and you meet a lot of other people coming the other way. We quite often get it here, but then you give it six, seven thousand feet, just cruise along. It's lovely. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. That's why you know, Eastburn's got another name for snow. Yeah, that's just Any more questions on what we've done? Because that was your agenda. That was very good. Can we talk about one last thing, um, which is. One last thing is tracking. The club has a rule that everyone should be tracking and a lot of people aren't. Um, if you're basically out of sight of the airfield, you're out of sight of the airfield, you should be tracking. Um, most of we, any of us will be flying or have cell coverage so you can track with your cell phone. Um, the iPhone is a very, very easy program to load. Um, Android a bit harder, but the, on the GNZ website you'll find information. But if you have your iPhone or your Android phone in your pockets, um, it'll be tracking for you. If you're going further afield and into any of the black holes where there's no cell coverage, then a Iridium or a Spot um, tracker um, is not as, not as precise, but it's a good safety measure. But um, you know, tracking is essential. I mean, if you basically have a glider plopped into the beach forest, um, up near us, um, it might take you a day or two to find it. Um, so, if anyone says, "Oh, we don't need tracking because we know where we are or whatever," uh, it doesn't matter where you know where you are when you're flying. I think it, it should be visible. It's a wonderful, uh, it's, it's a free, basically free. So you can just 
Yeah. Well, it was actually, it was a $6 upload. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the app was $6 yeah. or something, yeah. cheaper. You, you probably need a power pack, though, that sucks your phone dry. Yeah, it does battery dry. Um, it's, yeah. it's just a, a life, life saver if something goes wrong. Mm. It's, it, is a, it is a clever rule, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. Just, so, yeah. and you're staying within 10 yeah. nautical miles, and there's a yeah. phone coverage in all of that 10 yeah. nautical miles. Yeah. It will disappear if you disappear into the woods, but we yeah. know within half a mile of where you are. Yeah. Okay. We've got a few going to the woods. Yeah, there's a helicopter. We attended the beach forest up at um, Mount Arthur about five years ago. We knew where he was within a couple of miles because he had a tracker, but it was only tracking every couple of minutes. And it took three helicopters three days to find him. And I only found it because of a piece of A4 paper from his log book hung up in a tree. Jeez. So, you know, and What's the, what's the golden rule? 30 minutes or an hour or something. You know, the mortality goes yeah. like that for time. So if you come unstuck, it just, could. Yeah, just remember also it's a good idea. Like the, tonight's talk was about getting you to the 90 minutes. You know, that mm -hmm. was what most of you need. Um, I can go on to the end of the world if you want, you know, and Frank can take you down to the end of the world and steer an island back. You know, but you don't need that at the moment. You need the 90 minutes. That's all you need is, is to be safe and be able to soar. And certainly tracking, you, you will be within tracking at all times up until you get 90 minutes. Once you get out of there, well, you, know, you, you go out of range. And ADSB doesn't work yeah. between the lake and the gun club. I disappear on the radar with the absolute latest piece of kit. <laughs> the phone doesn't. <laughs> something perhaps that might be picked up at briefings but on the day but um, was a couple of gliders or three or something on the same short piece of ridge um, yeah. I think you had a nice expression for the rules for the five or the MOB well, the mm -hmm. might be other bugger or something <laughs> What was that again? Uh, Missed the other bug. <laughs> um, Catherine asked me about the, the rules. I said, stuff the law, miss the other one, is the yeah. first thing. Because if you're going head on and the ridge is on the right for me and it's not on the right for the other person, who has the right of way? The one with the ridge. You do, because you've got the ridge on the right. Because, because, the ridge right. Right. because I can't, can't turn right. and cross. Mm. Yeah. However, if you're like we were, slightly like that, mm. And we're going to pass without no problem, mm. bollocks to the law, mm. because I can see you, you can see me, yeah. everybody's happy. For me to turn right means I'm turning in front of you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So <laughs> don't kill yourself, you know, don't, well, it's a bit like crossing the crossing, you go the right way, but you still won't run over. Yeah. No, you know, just use some common sense. Mm. But yeah, using the ridge, spatial awareness is really important on the ridge. Like, always know who's up. Remember, there'll be other people up as well. You know, look on the ground, all oh, CX has disappeared, shit, you know? Mm. You need to know where they are. You need to know where you think they're going to be. It was quite funny, we were soaring the other end. Catherine was convinced that you should have been down the end, down the forestry. You know, and you were just out here and said, oh, come on, where is he? And you were looking right where you thought he was going to be, but he, he turned around. And then I, know I couldn't see you another time because you and you and Ian were at my bum. Yeah, you know? I can see you. <laughs> just, just make sure you can see it. Stay off the radio unless you absolutely have to, because that's 1191, and he uses that when he wants to land at um, Okatika and Greytown and the other places, don't you? They're all, um, yeah. I still think that's a situation if you've got three people on a ridge. I would talk. I mean, it's, a situational, see it's a situational awareness tool, you know, or if you, think, you, if, you, if you think you've seen someone here, you can't see him again, maybe a hey where are you? It's, it's not a let's have a conversation about yeah. going and see Bill, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a do. situational awareness tool. If you if you want to find out where somebody is, Absolutely. I'm here, where are you? Cool, now my picture's that much better, Absolutely. I'm not going to run into you. Absolutely, so, and we did that. I'd be afraid of using the radio. But what tends to happen is he tends to get his use as a telephone. Yeah, so just is. remember 1191 is a common frequency that Air New Zealand use for land at Westport. But I'd also rather go into Hokitea. I like when people talk back to me. You'll be amazed at people that don't use it because I think they're afraid to. Mm. And next thing you know, there's a helicopter going past the window. 
No one cares if you're like, I'm here, I'm doing this, perfect, now I'm not going to hit you. Just, <laughs> you know, make it useful information, as you say. It's not a it's, chat about the cup of tea and I'll, had a great night at your house last night, but it's a give me something useful. I'm over here in the thermal. I totally agree that what's frustrating is you've got two of them which are never going to hit in each other in the middle of in, ever, ever, ever. And the other one says, oh, I'm over on your left wing tip, you know. And yeah. there's no way that they're going to hit each other. And they're just saying it for the sake of saying it. Like, yeah. cut those out. But you can't see someone who couldn't see you when we left the winch. I asked you where the hell you were. If you got you, no problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but that's, yeah. The radio is there as a safety tool, mm -hmm. but it's not telephone. To help the whole picture. Oh. Wrap it up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael Frank, and uh, it's really good. Oh, and if you make an agenda for the next one, you need to put all that in brackets and then come back and talk about it. Yeah. What worked and what didn't work. Middle of the summer or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.